Welcome everyone to the final event um, for MS Doug for this year. So it's the final event for 2020. It's the wonderful world of .NET 5. And today we have a very special guest um, joining us today. Um, it's, uh, he's Scott Hanselman. He's a part of partner program manager at Microsoft. I don't think I need to um, give him much of an intro, but we are very, very privileged to, uh, to have you today. Um, and I hope you'll be back um, again, again very, very soon. Uh, Scott's going to do a session on .NET yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, after that session, um, Matthew Libowitz will be speaking about Blazor and, and everything to do with Blazor and Blazor and Xamarin. And I'll be ending the year with um, speaking a little bit about .NET and IoT solutions. But, but enough from me right now. Um, let's go over to Scott because Everyone's not here to listen to me. Definitely here for Scott. Thank you again for for attending tonight. Are we live? We are live. Over to you. Cool. Do I have any way to see what's going on in the producer side? Um, no, you, you're a presenter. Um, okay. But if you share the content, um, 
I can take it live for you. All right, fantastic. There we go. It's the joys of Teams Live. Yeah, I usually am producer as well. Cool. <laughs> I'll oh. make you use it. Do me a, yeah, that'd be cool. OK, there you go. Lovely. Let's see if that actually goes and figures itself out. I think sometimes if I join with a presenter link, it's a little a little goofy. Nope, it doesn't matter. Didn't see. Cool, but you can see me and you can see my screen, right? I can see you. I can see your screen. And yep. the live folks can as well. Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. All looks good. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Thank you, Alan and Matthew, for your hard work. All right, friends. So this is live, and that's the thing that's so important. That is so important. Now, of course, I see here in the Q and A, Gordon asked if the recording of the event will be made available. Hopefully, we will get that out at, after the event. But it's super important to note that this is a live event, which means uh, it's not a YouTube. I'm not going to talk at you if I can avoid it. Hello, Ronald. Uh, people are saying hi in the Q&A. I love it when people doing live events have the questions and the chats coming. So if you're in this event with us today and you have questions for myself or Alan or Matthew, please do ask them. Uh, the I can talk all day about .NET and I will, but I really, really like it when you add to the conversation with your voice. So please do drop them in. I've got the live Q&A sitting right here and I'll start, but I also want to hear from you about your questions about .NET and where we're going and where we've been. All right, let's have a chat. So back in the day, back in the day, if you went to the C Windows Microsoft.NET framework folder, you would see something like this. This is a really interesting screen. We're on Windows on my C drive, and I've got a bunch of versions of .NET. And this all started somewhere around 2002, 2001. And in fact, my uh, blog, just until very, very recently, was actually running on .NET 2.0. And .NET 2 is actually older than some of y'all, some of you who are on this call. And uh, my blog has been going on for almost 20 years. And uh, there's some interesting things about .NET, and there's some not interesting things about it. The worst part of .NET was that it is on the Windows drive, meaning it was a Windows-only thing for the longest time. And uh, we made it as a runtime that would run on Windows, and it has goofy versioning numbers. Don't worry about that. And uh, But recently, we've moved it over to .NET Core. Now, a friend of ours went and created a very interesting slide that I'm going to share with you today. This is actually a, a new slide. I've never shown this before. Still working on it, but check this out. Let me make this full screen. This is pretty cool. This answers the big fundamental question of how is .NET 5 related to .NET Framework and .NET Core? So this is just an attempt to get it to uh, understand, uh, be more understandable. So you notice here, 2015 .NET Framework 4.6, a couple years later, 4.7, notice that the .NET framework, when we say .NET framework, that means the Windows 1 that I just talked about. That .NET framework means the Windows versions of .NET. And you'll notice there, between 2015 and 2019, we only made it from 4.6 to 4.8. So that kind of slowed down. It's pretty clear that things are slowing down. Um, Ronald is saying he can see just me, but not see the screen, but not me. Would you mind putting me as a little tiny head, Alan, off to the corner of the screen? You are a tiny head. I uh, like being a tiny head. I appreciate that. Is, that. is that the current uh, the current uh, template there in Teams Live events? Yes. Unfortunately, we can only have one tiny head, and that's definitely you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, I'm sure that Teams Live events will have a lot of new features soon that will have many people involved at the same time. Cool. So you see down here as we've got .NET Framework 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, it's kind of slowing down. That doesn't feel like a lot of big numbers as we move this direction. And that is because the .NET Framework 4.x is basically done. And this is an interesting thing because uh, it's been around forever and it will be supported forever. It's going to be in Windows forever. 
People don't realize this. Do you know, Alan, that uh, Visual Basic 6 applications work just great right now in 2020? VB6, VB5, yes. they still work. They work and they work great and they work forever. And that is okay. The .NET framework, the one that comes with Windows, the one that is installed with Windows, the one that is on a billion computers is just fine and it's going to be there forever. Okay, but it only works on Windows and it's done. It's basically finished. There's a difference between being dead and being done, right? My dad is retired, but he's not dead. He's yeah. just done. Oh, there's, a, there's a very good question here. Um, should we delete those old versions? Hmm. Should we keep that is a them? Great Can question. we delete them? Great question from JP. I would hmm. encourage you not to delete any versions of the .NET framework. This is the full Windows version. Don't go in this folder and don't mess with those because there are all kinds of aspects of the uh, of .NET that are um, needed by Windows itself. Windows is actually using some of those things. So I would definitely not do that. In fact, there used to be a tool, I wonder if it's still around, mm -hmm. that was called CLR Ver. CLR Ver. I wonder if that's still around. CLR Ver .NET. The CLR version tool reports all installed versions of the runtime. Let me see if this is still available. This may be a little bit dated. I'm going to open up a Visual Studio command prompt and let's run CLR ver and see if it's still. Ah, look at this. Did you know about this? This is what I love showing people tools that they've never seen and they never knew existed. Mm -hmm. So I have I'm in Visual Studio developer command prompt that I added to my Windows terminal. I type CLR ver and I believe this is from memory. It's been 20 years. CLR ver dot dash a it's dash all look at this clr ver dash all when you're in a command prompt and you probably have this on your machine will show you the running processes with their pids their process ids here on the side and what version of the clr that they're currently using now even though it says 4.0 it is the latest version installed in your machine which in everyone's case will be 4.x so currently powerpoint has that open. The one password application has that open. A PowerShell, Windows PowerShell has that open. So uninstalling old versions of the .NET framework would break all of those things. So that answers that question. Yeah, but so, so, so bad things will definitely happen. Bad things will happen. There be dragons. So <laughs> the .NET framework, think of the .NET framework as a fundamental part of Windows that is something you don't want to mess with. Unfortunately, Microsoft is historically bad at naming things. And rather than calling the next version of .NET, you know, .NET Falcon Fury 1.3 or something, we went and we called it .NET Core. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Everyone knew what .NET was. And Core meant the essence of something. It was a pared down, you know, the, 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 the brains, the guts, the heart of .NET, and it seemed like a great name. Well, fast forward as we made .NET Core, which is our cross-platform version of .NET, and we go this direction, it starts to become as capable as, or more so, as the Windows framework. So it eclipses it, right? The child becomes better than the parent. So then we're gonna get into .NET 5. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But remember and then, here- And then why, while you're looking at that, where does Mono put in? Ah, lovely, excellent question, sir. So Mono, I didn't put it on this slide here, but let's talk about that in Notepad. This Notepad is where all good questions are uh, are asked. So .NET Framework, I can't type when 100 people are looking. That's Windows only, okay, Windows only. .NET Core, everywhere all the things and then mono so mono is what's called a clean room re-implementation of dotnet now mono was created to make dotnet work on linux that's because at the time the dotnet framework was windows only and folks said you know we want our own we want a linuxy anywhere dotnet but it's a clean room version. That means I want to write C-sharp. 
I want to run it anywhere, but I can't look at the source code for this. So how can I do that? Well, I'll just do it again in a clean room and I'll do it all by myself without looking at the source code. But then Mono became Xamarin the company and Xamarin got bought by Microsoft. So then suddenly there were three .NETs. There was .NET Core, .NET Framework, and Mono, and they're all hanging out together. Except Mono's libraries, Mono's functions, were basically rewrites of these. And then .NET Core was basically improvements of these. So we had three different runtimes, three different library piles. What's the right thing to do? Well, we should unify them. We should pick one. We should move them towards uh, a single direction. So if I added mono to this, there would be another line that was kind of heading in this direction. You've got a lot of repetition here, and that's not a useful thing. I want to juxtapose, though, here. I've got Microsoft.NET Framework, and I'm going to open up program files, and I'll bring that over here. And I've got a folder called .NET and a folder called SDK. So we've got .NET Windows here, W for Windows, and we've got C program files .NET, and we've got all of these versions. Now, the question of do I delete the old versions came up. That did not specify .NET Framework versus .NET Core. Should you delete these? Well, these are machine installed versions of .NET. If you're a developer, you could certainly remove the SDKs. You could delete those and just keep the latest one. In fact, there is a tool, .NET remove old versions. And I think it was .NET Core. Let's try that again. There's a tool, it's a global tool. There it is, the .NET Core uninstall tool. It's up on GitHub. And it's a goofy little tool that someone made that's really lovely. It was made by one of our interns and then worked on by the CLI team. And I want to find the docs. There's the docs. Official docs. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Here we go. This is great. Check this out. It actually has a what if. So you can run it and it'll tell you what it might uninstall if, if given the chance which is pretty cool. I could actually probably run this right now and say .NET, run it, .NET Core uninstall. Let's see if I have this installed. Let's see if we can mess up my computer today, shall we? Is that a good Core thing uninstall. to do before a demo? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. You should totally try to run uninstall demos right before yeah. you do something. It's just absolute chaos. Living on the edge. Yeah, this whole thing is gonna go very, 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 very badly. There you go, look at that. So this is really interesting. The tool cannot uninstall versions that are installed or used by Visual Studio. So it's it says, I don't want to install these. So I've actually already run this before. And it's like, no, I'm going to go ahead and keep these because this one's needed for the main version of BS. That's for 2017, that's for 2019. So I've pared it down mostly to everything that needs to, uh, to happen. But if you've got uh, some vestigial pieces of .NET that are lying around, then you could certainly go and check that out. But they're not that big and I wouldn't worry about it. But yes, if you were installing the daily builds every single day, that could be a challenge. That won't be the case for .NET 5 because when .NET 5 comes up, we're gonna try to roll up and clean up the old stuff. So uh, the, the older versions will kind of move forward, okay? Now, somewhere around here, is where things got really confusing. .NET Core 3.1 is what's called an LTS or a long-term support version of .NET. And by the way, I just wanna remind folks again, if you've just joined us or you're joining us late, this is a live event on the right-hand side, there's a q and I would love it if you would just put questions in there because I'm alone in my room here in Portland, Oregon talking to myself. I do have Alan and Matthew to keep me company. <laughs> But you tell me that you're out there when you can put questions in the Q&A. Gordon says that he likes my YouTube, and I thank you for that, Gordon. That's very kind of you to point that out. Definitely subscribe to my YouTube. I, uh, I make dozens of dollars on YouTube right now. It's huge. So uh, I'm enjoying that very much. If I go to the .NET homepage and I hit download, there are two versions up there right now. 
.NET 5, the current version, and then .NET Core 3.1, the long-term support version. That long-term support version will be supported for some years, and I can actually click where it says all .NET Core downloads, and it'll tell you exactly when it goes away. So right now, that will be supported, fully supported until December, two years from now. That's pretty cool. So three years total of support. And that is uh, significant because I want to ask myself, what version of .NET do I want to pick? Now, this is the recommended version, but it'll be supported for about a year. We're going to support for long-term support uh, every other year, just like Ubuntu, uh, the operating system, not the philosophy. Uh, we are going to uh, support kind of every other version. So .NET 5 is a current version, .NET 6 will be LTS, and we'll bounce back and forth. So why did we name this thing .NET 5? And we skip .NET Core 4, literally because 5 is, is bigger than 4.8. That's it. We want people to know that you can run your Windows things on this new version of .NET. We drop the core, we drop the framework, and we're unifying all of these things. So to your question originally, Alan, the goal here is that Mono and .NET and .NET Core all unify into one individual thing. The way that, and then here, remember I mentioned .NET 6, that'll be LTS, that, then 7 will be current, and then 8 will be LTS, and we'll bounce like that, which is pretty cool. I should have questioned. Um, so when you say this long-term support, that's nice. It's supported for a long time. But what happens to the other ones? Is it going to stop working? Uh, should we yeah, upgrade right. immediately? Yeah. What's the? That's a great question. So they'll never stop working. They'll never just spontaneously combust or disappear. But if there was some bug that you found, let's say that you're using, like right now, if you're using .NET 4.0 from you know 10 years ago, and you find a bug, no, that's definitely not something that uh, we're going to support. You need to get on a version that is supported. So if you, for example, were using .NET 2.0, and you called us and you're like, hey, I'm using .NET 2.0, .NET Core 2.0, I, I would say, gosh, could you go and see if you can reproduce that bug on 2.1, the long-term support version? And then once you got onto a supported version, then we would be able to help you debug that, possibly fix it, and figure out what the next next steps are. That's a great question. In fact, I added to my own personal website at the very bottom, I have three different websites. I've got my homepage, my blog, and my podcast. I put, this isn't just a text at the bottom of a screen, that's actually generated, okay? So if we hit Hansel Minutes, which is my podcast and we go down to the bottom that is also five and i can see the build number and the commit and i can click on that and we'll actually go over to azure devops and i can see exactly when it was deployed and how long it took and if i hit my blog which is not dotnet 5 it's actually dotnet core 3.1.9, that's the long-term support version. And then here's the commit from GitHub, and then there's the build right there. So in this case here, I have one site, Hanselman.com, that is really three mini sites, the blog, the homepage, and the podcast. And I'm using different versions of .NET based on my tolerance for support issues. With .NET 5, it's very stable. In fact, the .NET website, um, does anyone have any issues with audio? I think I sound decent. Little question sounding, there from the chat. Sounding good on this side. Yeah, All right. Sounding good here. Okay. So um, .NET Core 3.19 is long-term support. This made me feel like, well, if I didn't want to update my blog every year, if I wanted to just put something live and let it run, all I really have to do is take the bug fixes. And that's an important thing to think about. So if I go over to the .NET web page and I hit download and we go to .NET Core, this says supported. If I open up out of supported, you can see these other versions, 3 and 2.1, et cetera. All right. And if we go and dig into that, look at all the downloads. They're actually making it hard to find, which is good. I don't, oh, here we go. This is great. This is where you get to like all the detail, like way more detail than you want. Okay. There is the SDK, which is the compiler. 
And then there's the runtime, that runtime bundle. So Stephen is asking, does .NET Core need to be installed on the target computer or can be included with my app? That is the fundamental interesting thing about what's going on here. So let's talk about that. Great question. So .NET Framework installed on Windows. .NET Core runs anywhere. Okay, how do you deploy? Depends. You can, well, let's say you're a host. You can install the runtime bundle, or the hosting bundle. And that means you put in .NET Core in one place, and then your apps can use it. Or you do what's called a self-contained install. And that means your app holds .NET. Here's where things get interesting, though. Let's say that there's a bug or something going on. Do you want the operating system or do you want the uh, the host that is managing your site to go and update .NET for you? Then you would probably want it to be installed at the system level. Do you want to be responsible for those yourself? Do you have a way to update your application? Then you're going to do a self-contained. Let's see an example of that. So let's go out to the desktop. And um, and thank you for that question. So do, 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 do. Is, it, Where is, it purely, is it purely who you want to have responsible for updates? Is there benefits um, performance wise or any implications of doing any of these? Question, let's do this. I'll make a folder. Oops. Oops. Ah. Everyone's looking. Okay, I have an empty folder here. <laughs> I'm going to say .NET dash dash version. This is .NET 5, OK? It's installed where .NET right there in program files. I'm going to say .NET new win forms. I'm going to make a Windows forms application, something that was historically only made with .NET 4. So here it is. Then I will say .NET build. Cool, .NET run. And uh, which monitor is this thing going to pop up on? Oop, over here. There you go. So here's my Windows Forms application written in .NET 5. Yay. I'm going to type start dot, and I'm going to start up the uh, Windows Explorer in the current uh, folder. And that'll probably pop up somewhere as well. There we go. We'll go into bin debug .NET 5. OK. Here is a executable right here for 140k so to answer the question that was asked do i need net for that yes because that's the stub that's the little that's just my code that's not nets right so if i gave you alan or anyone on the call that executable and you double clicked on it and you didn't have net 5 it wouldn't work you would say i don't have net 5 on this machine they would have to install the runtime. That's the kind of traditional way that .NET has worked, where uh, I got a call from my dad once, and he said, I need to install .NET, and I didn't understand why my, my parents would want that. He wanted to install paint.NET, and paint.NET had a dependency on .NET, so then he wanted to go and, uh, and get that. So probably if, I was, if, if my non-technical parent were my customer, I really want that to be a single executable that he doesn't have to to think about. So if I search for Hanselman winforms.net, I believe I blogged about this, how to make a winforms app and publish as one self-contained file. Blah, 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 Scott's talking. And then I'm gonna go and do this line. And instead of saying .NET build, I'm gonna say publish and I'm gonna pick, who am I publishing this for? I'm publishing it for Windows. I'm gonna publish a single file. So this version of my thing, okay, and we'll go back to our folder, is going to be a full build, and it's going to install .NET. And notice this here, this is kind of interesting. 295 items here. It basically took all of .NET Core and put it in a folder. That's a lot. So I could hand someone that folder and they could double click on it and it would work. So it's self-contained, 
but it's also 300 megabytes, which is a kind of obnoxious, right? It's not bad, but it's not awesome. I think we can all agree it's not awesome, okay? Now, there's lots of different ways that I can do uh, self-contained, but in this case here, I can also say slash p publish, publish trimmed equals true, and I can remove the bits that I'm not actually using. So I'm going to remove the parts of .NET that I don't need, put it all into one file, and this is called tree shaking. You're basically taking the executable and you're giving it a good shake, and then any functions you don't call will just fall away. You see it's actually taking a little bit longer to do that. I never remember where it ends up. I think it ends up in here. Here we go. It ends up in the publish folder. Okay, and it's compiling. Well, while it's compiling, I, another question I was thinking of, of um, oh gosh, I lost the question. Um, uh, I'll get back to you with that uh, as I saw that. Yeah, you know, while you're on that, what is the difference between the tree shaking and like the .NET linker? Tree, the tree trimming or tree shaking is part of the .NET linker. It's part, it's a step in the process here. Okay. So here is a single 145 meg executable with Windows Forms. So right there, I can hand someone that executable and they can double click on it. And because I published it for Windows uh, X64, it'll run and it'll work anywhere. So that don't, I do not have to install .NET uh, 5 to get that to work. I just hand them the exe, which is kind of the expectation that you would always have. It's the obvious thing that a, uh, a customer or my non-technical parent would, uh, would want. Uh, James is asking a question here. If I publish the folder to a server, can I update it while someone is running? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. We could find out. I can run it and see. Yeah, it looks like not. It says the process cannot access the file because it is being used mm -hmm. by another process. Or process, as they say that side. Um, so yeah, it doesn't look like you can do that. But there are things like click once that, that actually, instead of, no, overwriting the user's program the next time they launch it will prompt to update that's so, a great yeah. point so there's click once mm -hmm. and there's also squirrel squirrel which is a uh, a dot net uh, it's actually teams uses squirrel squirrel installer come on google dot net squirrel My browser just go to town here. Oh, that sucks. Try again in another browser. <laughs> there we go. We're all for Windows. This is an installation and update framework. Yeah. So to Matthew's point, you know, you could put it in another folder and run it from that folder, run it from a temp folder. It could unfold right now the .NET. Um, um, single file published executables uh, unfold into memory. It could copy itself somewhere else and then unfold into memory. So there are ways to get around that. That's a good, uh, a good question. Is the trimmed option available in the VS publish dialog? That is a good question. I don't know. I haven't been there in a while. Let us find out. Sort of another yeah. question, sort of my original question that came up was, I noticed when you, when you build the app, so obviously it's running uh, WinForms, but like it's open in an old Visual Studio for .NET, I would just have, you know, the exe and maybe the PDB file, but this one has a depth file and then there is a, you know, the exe and the DLR. There were like five files in the folder. And what does that all mean? That's a good question. And actually they put that, if we go back to my blog post, there was a conversation that was linked to from here about exactly what files are needed. So this is for WinForm specifically, but for the most part, the PDB can be ignored because the PDB is a debug file. So for most regular apps, console apps and things like that, there is a single file is truly a single file. If you only say single file with applications that make native calls to Windows, like a Windows Forms application, 
you'll need that and these four native application files. These are things that could not be embedded inside of that. Or you use this add-on, include native libraries for self-extract. Because what that means is we're taking everything in the folder and zipping it up, but we don't want to just unfold it into temporary space. In .NET 3.1, we would unzip everything into a temporary folder. So you might be in C colon backslash Matthew and think that when you double click, your application would still be there, but it would end up off in temporary wherever. And that would be very confusing. So it's not what you would expect as a, as a person who wrote that. Um, so then we wanted to have that unfold and unzip into memory, but unzipping a managed DLL, a .NET DLL is different than unzipping a native DLL. So we have to th treat those native ones differently. And there's a GitHub issue that talks exactly about that. Now, as far as the depths files and stuff, those are gone when you do a true single file. So those can be ignored. I think they are needed for like ASP.NET or if you were gonna make like a tiny microservices file and we can test that theory as well. The great thing about all of these questions is that they can all be tested. So we go down here and we go .NET new web. And then we go back up. So can a web application also be a single file? So I can deploy this to some sort of server out there and just copy one single exe. That's <laughs> that uh, run. Point, you still need some of the um, you still need some of the only why this keeps hanging. I think I've got an antivirus that's mad at me here. Um, to a point, you do have some um, the JavaScript, the, the JavaScript files for the host are still required for the microservices. This guy's starting to bug me now. <laughs> I might have some hang, I think I have a build that's hanging from before. See how that keeps hanging? And then my antivirus goes nuts. Let me try killing some .NETs that I may have that are sitting around from the background. Yeah, one second. While, you, while you're nuking stuff, there's a there's quite a hard question here um, and probably one that most people want to know the answer to. Should you upgrade from .NET Core 3.1 LTS to .NET 5 or should you just wait for .NET 6? What's your recommendation on that? So that is a very good question. People should not be waiting around, in my opinion. If you're doing active .NET development, no, you should not be sitting around waiting for some version. It, long term support is about support. It's not about uh, stability or quality in any way. It's literally what Microsoft will uh, allow you to get supported without being without you paying anyone. Uh, there you go. So this is the app settings .json is required for that that web application. Now let me try it again. Let's see if that works. I think I might be getting hung up in the in the trimmer here. There we go. So that would be the minimum a web app would need. The executable and the two JSON file. Okay. So um, back to the question about support. I was able to upgrade from .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 5 in about 20 minutes. It's not hard. If you are not calling any you know, crazy comm APIs or doing anything really unusual, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you're doing some uh, third party libraries or some, some different libraries, you could run into trouble, but it's not a big deal. We don't wanna make it hard for people to hop from place to place. I think if your comp it's really about your company's tolerance for uh, upgrades. If you have a CI CD system, you know, if you have a continuous integration system and you can set it up like I did for my own stuff, uh, I made a .NET 5 branch, I tested it, I went and had it go running and it worked just great. And then I can decide, you know, am I gonna be running this every month? Can I just update my application? Am I comfortable with that? Then I went to .NET 5 and you'll notice that I had three websites my homepage, my podcast, and my blog. And two of them I went to .NET 5 and one of them I didn't. And I did that because my kind of tolerance for rebuilds 
is less on the blog. The same kind of thinking should be applied to your own company. You know, if we're a company that only deploys once a, once a year and we really want that to be kind of stable and supported and dealt with, then maybe you want to stick with an LTS version. Yeah, I would encourage an individual who asked that question, though, to have a version of the app running on .NET 5 now, whether you ship it or not. That way, when 6 comes out, you're kind of always following the tail and being ready. Yeah, yeah so what I'm hearing is you should continuously test. Yeah. You Get should always yes. absolutely not, uh, not a good idea, absolutely. And when you say the long term support, like let's say I'm using version five right now and there's a bug, is it just like, OK, I have to wait for six before they will fix the bug? Is it like they will fix it for me? Like what is the, the short term support sort of, you know, for .NET 5 and .NET 7 coming up? Sorry, someone at my job is yelling at me. One second. All right. Sorry. Answer that question. Yeah. Ask the question again. What, what is I'm the? Team, I'm in teams with you all, which means yeah. I had to run teams. So then my job is on the other monitor, and they're like, bah, bah. Sorry. With, with the with the support, obviously long term support, like Microsoft to continue to fix my bugs. What about the short term support? Um, is that when a bug comes up, saying .NET five, I just hope for the best, and maybe they'll fix it, maybe they won't. Uh, is there some sort of, you know, am I on my own, or or what? What does that mean? You know, obviously. So if things are in support, you're never on your own. If a bug comes out and you're out of support, the answer is join us in the next version, right? Like if a horrible bug showed up in Windows 7 right now, the answer is move to Windows 10, right? If you're on a version of .NET and something happens, we go back over to our .NET homepage and we hit here and we take a look at our support dates. You know, your... Uh, version of .NET 3.1, you still got two years. If you came to me in 2023 on a four or five year old version of .NET, I will say, well, you can maybe pay me for support, not me, but you know, pay Microsoft for support. Or uh, really, you should keep upgrading. And if I'm in .NET 5, that's currently in support. So that's then you'll get. Yeah, then you'll get so you'll have you'll be supported, meaning it'll be updated and everything is going to be OK. Yeah, you can actually scroll down to the bottom and click support and there is a full support policy that it kind of explains exactly how this works. So it says here. .NET Core provides long term support, which is three years of free support. And patches to the LTS releases are compatible, eliminating risk for applications. So you, you, you like I am taking you know, every month or so updates to .NET 3 in the form of the runtime. So if we get back over to here and we ask ourselves, what are the ways I can deploy this? I can deploy it as a hosting bundle or I can deploy it as a self-contained install. If I, if a new version that comes out that fixes a bug, it is up to me with a self-contained install to fix that and to update the uh, the installation, right? I need to go and figure out how my installer is going to update that. But if it's a runtime bundle, then we've got a new thing that just started. If we go over to the .NET blog, this we just announced. We're going to bring updates to Microsoft Update. So there's Windows Update and there's Microsoft Update. So Windows Update is what you are familiar with, right? That's where you go into Windows, you go into Microsoft Update. If I go there now and go, hey, check for updates. I go over here and then there's optional updates. Oh, look, look at that. I didn't even realize that would be there. So there's an update right there. So that means that my locally installed, my, my system installed version of .NET will be updated. Now, do you think that my Windows Forms application that I made for my non-technical parent just now would get updated? Probably not, right? Because it is statically linked. So you have to be thinking about your tolerance. Now, Microsoft Update is not Windows Update, right? Microsoft Update updates Microsoft products. Windows Update just updates Windows because sometimes people don't want that stuff, right? And then to walk through the whole process exactly how these things work. OK. Isn't that cool? Yep. 
very cool. There's actually a bunch of questions sort of talking about updates. I thought I would just mention some of them. So the first one sort of talking about uh, .NET Framework 4.7. If that's going to be supported for, you know, Infinity, uh, what happens when we need something new? For example, TLS 1.3. Will Microsoft add that? Will they, you know, say move to .NET Core? What is an idea for adding a critical bug or something to .NET Framework that we need to add? .NET Framework, the one for Windows? Yes. Yeah. So that is part of Windows. So that continues to be serviced and updated through Windows. Right. So think about .NET is now .NET Framework is a fundamental part of Windows. And if there were there's still a servicing team, there are still people updating and improving that and fixing that. Uh, so here's a great question there about I saw I saw one go by about TLS. Right. If there was some fundamental thing like in supporting a new cryptography version or something on .NET or the next version of TLS, uh, I'd have to ask the, the 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 team, or we could ask Scott Hunter on uh, on on Twitter. And uh, sort of the next two questions, or it's not really a question, but it's the question about okay, I'm a, let's say a library developer or an app developer, and I want to check to see all my packages up uh, compatible with .NET five. Now, can I check to see it? How do I check that? Is there a way or do I just update and hope for the best and see what fails? Or, you know, obviously that's very package author specific, right? If the user doesn't do it or doesn't consider some new feature. But if i am got an app and I want to pull in this Nougat package, how do I make sure it's going to work when I upgrade my application to .NET 5? Test it. Um, <laughs> I don't understand the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But is that's just the testing. Is that a bad answer? Like, is there a place to see if it's compatible? Um, yeah. That's a tough one. So, like, you're saying, like, if you go to like NuGet and you want to look at something like Humanizer, will you know if this is compatible or not? Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's sort of the question. I see. It's is that the question? Will it work I... in .NET five? Yeah. So, like, .NET standard applications will work in .NET five. Like, most everything works in .NET five. Uh, .NET 3.1 um, will run, apps will run under .NET 5. The idea is for it to be um, to be compatible. I suppose yeah, the compatibility. If it runs on a previous version and .NET 5 is not breaking anything, then it would also exactly. work. However, yes. so, .NET 5 isn't 5 fundamentally changing the you know intermediate language. It doesn't change the jitter. It's not gonna. So like, if the, if the if the methods still line up, yes, it will still work. Uh, the question here about .NET 4.7, uh, yes, uh, I, I have to ask on TLS 1.3. So if you, the person who's asking that question at the bottom there about TLS can can chat me on Twitter or email me and I'll go and ask about that. Um, but yes, it will always be .NET 4.7 or 4.8 or whatever. I think the question was about .NET framework uh, and TLS 1.3. That's really got it. Or not? Yeah, so I see the problem. Microsoft TLS, so TLS 1.3 is supported in, in 4.8, and I'm hearing that person say that they cannot upgrade to 4.8. So starting with .NET 4.7, by default, it uses the operating system TLS version. So the issue isn't .NET as much as it is the version of, of, of Windows that you're on. So for example, if you're on a version of Windows that doesn't support TLS 1.3, there's nothing we can do about it. The operating system doesn't support it. Question here about .NET Standard. So .NET Standard, when there was a .NET Core and a Mono, independent, independent, indie, and I know how to spell. Okay. .NET Standard was a way to deal with all of these different .NETs, and .NET Standard was just an API versioning scheme. It isn't necessary if there is only one .NET. So when there are multiple .NETs, you can target the standard and it'll run anywhere. But when there is just one .NET 5, if you target .NET 5, it runs anywhere because that's the only .NET that there is. So as we start to unify things like this diagram here, the .NET standard matters less and less. And I think 
Emo talked about this on the .NET blog, .NET standard. Yeah. But will, will .NET standard continue though, even though they're unified? Uh, it will not continue to be versioned mm -hmm. because those versions of .NET are basically already handled. So to this to this point right here, Mono, Xamarin, .NET Core, and the .NET Framework become mm -hmm. one single .NET 5 as we move into .NET 5 and .NET 6, which means a single SDK and one base class library. So when you tark, so it's almost like .NET 5 is a, is a version of the .NET standard itself. Mm. So .NET 5 is a combination. It's a superset of those things. It combines them all. And here, .NET, we won't be releasing a new version of .NET standard, but all future versions continue to support .NET standard. So all your .NET standard stuff will continue to work, which is cool. Um, a question here from Anonymous saying, what are the security implications for unfolding executables? What is a good idea? Is it a good idea for writing enterprise services? I, I don't know about the security implications. I'd have to ask our security person, but my opinion is that uh, it's about packaging and it's about convenience in packaging. Um, for me, I didn't bother with single executables for web applications and things like that. So I don't think it's useful as much as it's cool, but I don't think it's useful for like microservices and stuff. I just put them in Docker containers and I don't worry about it. Um, I think it's cool for um, Windows Forms apps, WPF apps and things like that. Now, you say that you prefer to have static executables marked read only. So if I mark this one read only, right and 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 run it it's still going to run we're not ever modifying the executable it simply unfolds into memory okay yeah i've got a question around things like wcf or windows communication foundation i see loads yeah. of companies still using it um what should they do Will it continue or should they move? The best thing that I can suggest that they do is they take a look at the core WCF mm -hmm. application. It depends on whether they need to be a consumer or a client of WCF or mm -hmm. if they are going to be a producer. Uh, core WCF is a port to .NET Core. It's open source um, and it's out there and it's part of the .NET Foundation. It's you know somewhat actively looked at. People are definitely trying to make things work. It's not years old or anything. So you can definitely take a look at that. Certainly the technology underlying it, things like SOAP and uh, those web services are quite old. So if you are simply looking for a WCF-like communication environment, you should be looking at gRPC. Mm, okay. And we've got a ton of information about how to do those those kind of services and that's kind of the way it's the modern remote procedure call situation and it's it's really stupid fast uh dotnet 5 is uh twice as fast or more than dotnet 3.1 that's really cool yeah so if you yeah. are trying to make it compatible again dotnet 4.x will be supported forever right so you know, feel free to use that. Uh, is there localization support? Yeah, we should have localization support uh, as well. I can go and dig up blog posts if people tweet me or, uh, or ask me those questions. That, that actually brings up another sort of a question. Like I'm using ResX from, from when, uh, the old .NET Core, uh, .NET Framework days and the old uh, stuff like that, the settings files and stuff. That stuff all works with the new .NET, uh, .NET five sort of wind forms and WPF. So all that existing technology and tooling I use for for those things sort of additional to the code, which I'm assuming you're quickly right here it's, now. Is it's going to be been working a couple still. Of years myself since I've done that, but they're the to the best of my understanding, all the localization stuff still works exactly as before. I don't know where the ResGen executable still is, so I'd have to look into that. I know that ResGen still exists. So if I go over here I believe ResGen, yeah, this is the resource generator that compiles between resource files. That stuff still exists. 
I can I can ask about that if folks want to ask me online. All right, I think we're getting to the end of our our hour here. We should get give. Uh, I should cede my time to uh, to you two. I don't mind asking you. No, questions. no, I, I don't mind. <laughs> if you willing oh, to stay, Ronald, I don't uh, need Mariah, to stay. <laughs> Ronald Mariah says they're finding very difficult to migrate from .NET Framework to .NET Core. Packages like Entity Framework with existing migrations. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, why don't you email me or chat me because I don't use Entity Framework, so I am not familiar with that. I'd have to plug you into the Entity Framework team. So upgrading from Entity Framework, upgrading. Ronald, are you upgrading from .NET uh, Entity Framework, the full version to Entity Framework Core? Is that what's causing issues? Because I know they did quite a lot of changes. Okay, that's updating to EF Core. Yeah, I was looking for blog posts or discussions. We haven't, we have on the .NET blog, that's kind of like the, there it is, this Entity Framework section. Actually, here you go. That would be a good person to talk to, Jeremy Lickness. Ronald, uh, Mariah, that would be a good question for either me or Jeremy. Maybe you can ask us on Twitter and find out what the uh, what the issue that you're bumping into on Entity Framework with existing migrations. Another good one I noticed the last, I know they had the community standups, so just sort of on a separate side note for, for anything. Microsoft has quite a lot of those community standups for mobile, for Entity Framework, for web, for even for just random topics. So definitely you know, check out the YouTube or the Twitch and um, yeah, and check those out. Yep. Don, I was asking how my shoulder is doing. <laughs> That's very kind to ask. Uh, it is about 60% right now. I had frozen shoulder and I had shoulder surgery. The left shoulder is good. That's because that one had surgery five years ago. The right one, I can only get my arm this high. It doesn't go any higher, it's locked but I'm having physical therapy, but I'm, I'm better than I was. I'm about 60% of optimal, but thank you for asking. Still, still painful though. All right. A lot, covered a lot of information there. I'll go back to this final slide here that we're just getting, we're working on this slide. This was a given to us by a friend uh, and we'll try to get this, um, updated because I think this is actually a pretty good representation about what's going on. Is there anything you excited about coming in .NET 6 and 7? Um, I think the single file stuff, particularly for Windows Forms and WPF apps is interesting. The, the Windows Forms designer is pretty cool. You know, just basically being able to make any Windows app of any kind is useful. Um, I've really liked the Docker support. Uh, so for example, if I go out to my my own system here for my podcasts. Come on. Wait, where you at? Nope, not going to work today. <laughs> so let's go to my podcast. So here's my podcast site, and I've got Docker build, run, and test as PowerShell files right here. So I can run my entire test suite in Docker and deploy ultimately over to uh, to Linux. And I've been able to move my blog, podcast, and homepage from Windows on a VM that I was paying at a host into Azure. And I run them all at the same time on a single Linux app service and uh, use containers. And it's got it's lowered my cost by about 30, uh, 30%, which is pretty cool. Mm. That is pretty cool. Yeah. And then Blazor. Um, being able to compile .NET to anywhere means compile to IL, com run on Linux, run on an Apple Watch, run on an Android. Being able to compile it into anything. There's a lot of crazy stuff people are doing on Blazor with like, there's a thing called Web Window that uh, Steve Sanderson has been talking about. Steve Sanderson Web Window, uh, possible cross-platform web view libraries. Like what does it mean if you could make a Blazor application and make it a, uh, a local app? That's interesting. I think Maui, the the .NET Maui, the uh, uh, what is it? Multi-application UI framework, basically write once, look good anywhere. That's pretty interesting. The next generation of Xamarin uh, looks cool. For me, it's all about being able to write C to know C sharp and write it anywhere 
but now I'm enabled to be a .NET developer that, that does containers, and now I can do Raspberry Pis, and I can do whatever. I don't have to learn another language. It's kind of selfish. Mm -hmm. I, I like to be able to run things anywhere without having to learn one more language. So there are all the .NET people who are on the call, and you might be saying, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm an ASP.NET developer or whatever. Well, now you are a iPhone developer and an Android developer and a whatever developer, and soon to be a Blazor or a uh, JavaScript developer. Sort of the nice thing with, with uh, running .NET everywhere is that it allows you to be more productive. I'm making an app. Let's work on this app. I know .NET like a mobile app to make a web app versus like, okay, I need to learn JavaScript and CSS for my web. Okay, let's an Objective C for my mobile. And you spend mm -hmm. all your time learning new things versus obviously learning is cool, but if you have to do it for work or be productive, um, you know. What's really nice is sharing the code between applications mm. so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Exactly. Reinventing the wheel is definitely a thing that we want to avoid as much as we can. <laughs> cool. So that's some good questions. Thanks for the energy from the uh, from the audience and asking all their uh, their questions. All right, I will go and get my children ready for school now because it is nine in the morning here. And as we enter the evening, uh, who 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 amongst us is next up uh, in this user group uh, festival? I will the, be. The, the next speaker is Matthew. You will be actually speaking about Blazor, which should be yeah. should be really cool. Excellent. Hopefully, I've set you up for success. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's going to be yeah, hard I'll, to follow. But yeah, I definitely I wouldn't want to follow you. <laughs> so that's why I'm going last. But thank you very, very much for spending time with us. It was really, really cool and really useful. Thank uh, you for I'm sure, I'm sure everyone that attended really enjoyed it. Thank you. And then one last little thing for the advertising portion of the, uh, of the, of the show. Um, I have a YouTube channel now that I'm enjoying very much called Computer Things the computer stuff they didn't teach you. So I would love it if folks would go up and subscribe. Uh, I've got a whole series here. I talk about home networking, about the cloud. If you're overwhelmed with programming, what are some things that you can potentially deal with? Using the command line like I do and setting up PowerShell, uh, Docker. I did one on Kubernetes, container orchestration. So definitely check that out. I'm very proud of it. And I'd love it if you would subscribe. Yeah, yeah. It's on that topic, living. yeah, on that topic, um, what do you have any good resources for students that's starting out? That that those are I would say my good resources for for students. The uh, computer stuff, the computer stuff they didn't teach you. I started at the beginning, and actually, you can go to computerstufftheydidnteachyou.com. I literally started carriage return line feed, mm. and yeah, those, you know, those once, are really once awesome. a carriage. What's a mm -hmm. carriage? Who's you know? I talk about basic text editing. I have a really good video on Git 101, so I would encourage students to uh, to check that out. And I made a I made a um, computer stuff they didn't teach you dot com just redirects to the playlist. No, that that's very cool. I'll make sure all our students definitely go there. <laughs> and as well for anyone anyone else wanting to learn the, the Microsoft learn stuff it's just absolutely amazing they cover every topic you're talking Azure mobile cloud uh, desktop services dockers all the all the things and their certifications you can get all the cool stuff so that is a great point there's a ton of good stuff there and if you go under products .net is listed as a top level product so there's a whole path there to learn C sharp and uh, they both have instructor led or self led courses so be sure to go to Microsoft Learn and click on products. Yeah, on that topic, while well, while we're showing it, um, for those that's joining us at our networking event afterwards, we have free exam vouchers for certification. So please oh. do attend and ask us some questions. Even better. Mm. Dig it. All right, cool. Ah, no, thank you, thank you very much. Time. No, thanks. thanks it was awesome again. I hope to see you very soon again. Right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye -bye. I've put the links for Scott's channel into the chat notifications. So as he did, as he said, sign up. Ah, so Lou has joined us. Hello, Lou. I screwed up my flight times. I'm sorry I'm late again. But at least okay. I got you.
Yes, yes. Welcome. And, uh, and I'm representing. Awesome. <laughs> OK, yes, we all got our, our T-shirts. Well, we can't all be on camera at the moment. Who's on camera now? Am I doing anything grotesque? OK, yeah, so, I would so, like to stay off camera. Thank you very much. And over to Matthew for Blazer All, all right. Things. OK, thank you. Ooh. So uh, Scott was talking about all the exciting stuff. Now I'm <laughs> going to try and do my best to be as cool <laughs> as him. I hope I uh, can flow nicely there. Let me share mm -hmm. some slides. No pressure. Yeah. <clears throat> so minimize. Let's see what I'm seeing. So my uh, laptop blew up, not quite, and my hard drive died um, like two days ago with all my stuff on it. And even though I can reproduce it. <laughs> this machine I'm using now is just not capable of running uh, running all the things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my camera and then I can share like Visual Studio and stuff. So I will share my screen and then turn off my uh, camera okay. just to save. So, so we, will, we won't put you live. <laughs> OK. I should be sharing my screen. It looks good. All right. OK, let me just get my face in the picture so I can give myself some energy. Wow, looking good. All right. <laughs> what happened there? All right, so, uh, yeah, so I thought I'd just do a quick intro into uh, Blazor, what it is for those who don't know, and see like, sort of just where it came from, and then just dive into code, because I love code and slides are cool. Uh, I stole some of the slides from um, the .NET Conf uh, other slide deck. So definitely, if you're interested in learning art, all the new stuff that happened at .NET, uh, .NET Conf is the, definitely the place to go. Uh, you can just Google .NET Conf 2020 slides, and I think there's a, a Microsoft blog post that will link to all the slides and all the videos. So if you want to find something about something specific that you know, either Scott spoke about or either I or uh, Alan will, is going to mention, you can definitely go check that out. And there's like deep dives into performance improvements for Blazor or, you know, using gRPC and stuff like that, some specific topics. So definitely uh, go check that out. Probably a bunch of entity framework and things as well. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into this. What is this Blazor? And Scott mentioned it and Blazor is a sort of really cool technology that I, I'm actually quite liking. Um, it is uh, basically designed for making web apps. Before we look at what Blazor is, let's have a look at what Razor is. Obviously, there's Blazor. Blazor is Razor in the way, in the browser, and they merged all the stuff. So now we got our cool fancy name of, of Blazor. But Blazor is based on uh, or makes use heavy use of Razor. And Razor is a is a cool uh, server side markup language which allows um, for uh, embedding server code in um, in web pages. Let me make sure that camera is off because. That was slowing down everything uh, for, for, for embedding uh, C sharp or VB code into HTML pages. So if you're making a website, you can obviously make it in pure HTML. But what happens if you want to enhance it, add more features? For example, you want to do control flow, you know, conditionals and things like that. So definitely you can use the C sharp and and you'll see on the next slide what it looks like. And this is things like, for example, you know, if you were using uh, ASP web forms or classic ASP, you know, the ability to use the, the Bumblebee braces or whatever they were called, or if you're using PHP, you know, you've got some sort of server logic and then it outputs some, some HTML. So this is what Race does. It's a, sort of a new, enhanced, improved version of, of the existing um, ways of doing things and they're trying to make it better. And with all of that, you take that code, it will generate HTML that browsers can render. So this is nothing fancy on the client side. It's just enhancing the server version of the files. It was not only can you just do HTML, and this is something really cool about Razor. It's sort of sort of framework agnostic in the sense that you can use it to generate XML as well because it's just angle brackets that it works with. And we actually use this in the, uh, when we do bindings for like Android X or, or the Google Play services or Firebase or you know Android support. That is like 80, 90 libraries to bind and Doing that manually with all the CS project files is going to be way over the top. So what we actually use is use Razor to generate our CS project files, which we then build. So that's really cool. We've got a little model. We write some logic. We use Maven. We read these files. And at the end of the day, we output us, um, the CS project that Visual Studio and all that understand because the output is 
simple XML, simple HTML rather than the enhanced one. So Razor is extremely powerful and definitely I would recommend checking that out. There's all variants of it, Razor Pages, MVC, and obviously now with Blazor. So enough about Razor. This is what the um, the code sort of looked like, as you can see with the, the UL and the LI and the unordered lists and the list items and the paragraph, that's normal HTML. But you can wrap that HTML, you can work with that HTML, you can massage that HTML by using C sharp code. In this case, it's C sharp, but there is a VB support. So if you um, if you want to use uh, like, OK, I've got some data, show the list. Oh, there's no data. Don't show the list. Put a message there. And this is how you can take your HTML. You can enhance the HTML so that it runs on the server. It does something and outputs HTML to the client. So that's really, really cool. And this is the power of, HTML, uh, of Razor. To, to generate uh, your HTML for you without having to copy elements and try to do some magical stuff. So what is Blazor? This power that we get with Razor, it allows us to, uh, to use Blazor, and Blazor makes great use of these features, to enable us to make web apps. This is like uh, web apps as in, you know, client server one, you've got something running on the server and it communicates with the client and you click on links and it's navigating as well as single page applications. And this is something really cool because you can make a, a web application that can actually run in either or of those locations. So you can say, OK, this is a uh, internal enterprise application. We want to run on a client server. We've got some secrets that can run on the server and then the, the user just gets HTML. Or you can say, hey, wait a minute. I want to run this directly on a client. I'm pushing all the code, all the DLLs to the client. And then um, you can make with the same code, the exact same code, you can actually write a website that runs 100% in the browser. And this is the awesome power of Blazor. It's allowing you to make a website well, web application that doesn't matter where it runs or how it runs, it just runs. And uh, you know, if you're running on a server, there's communication back and forth. And obviously, on a client, there's no need for communication back and forth. It can run in a an offline um, state because you know, if there's no need to send messages back and forth, you know, this can run in like a plain HTML page that's embedded in I don't know some CDN somewhere. And when you hit that link, it downloads all the files you need. And you're good to go. So that's Blazor's really cool. And I'll be showing some Blazor code. I actually have slides that I jump way through. Um, yeah, Blazor components. So Blazor is a massive framework, it allows you to do all that stuff I just said, you know, client, server, embedded, web assembly, all that thing. And the way it's done, it's built up with uh, sort of components called components. And these components are basically just a collection of, of stuff, whether it be UI, logic. It could be in a library or a nougat. Maybe it contains CSS or JS and all that stuff. It's just chunks of that to put together to make your website. So if I've got a page, the page is a component. But what if I have like a fancy control on that page? I don't know, some sort of date picker, let's say. That date picker can be a component. So component can contain components. So it's all this stuff. It's building blocks, putting it together using Razor to create a website that can run anywhere. So that's for me is a, is a total exciting uh, thing because you'll see in sort of the next half of the, the slide deck that I'm going to show you after this in code is how this can actually go and take this and do it on mobile and now mind blown you can just write using Razor everywhere and I think that is really exciting so if you don't like XAML you don't like sort of code behind so this is the cool way to do both together but not the same so before we talk about mobile I should get back to my ordered slides. We're getting off, off the track here. Um, there's, there's two sort of main parts to Blazor right now in support. Uh, it's the, the Blazor server side style of doing things. So this is um, messaging between your web browser, the user web browser, and the server somewhere on the cloud or some distant distant land. Uh, this one is, is simple. The server will do some work, generate HTML, and send the HTML to the client. Then when you click a link, you want to do a navigation, you open a, a dialog, whatever, the client will say, OK, server, I'm doing this action. And, uh, you know, the server will say, OK, this is the new HTML you have to render. And of course, the new HTML gets back. And this is not entire page being rendered, but rather chunks of pages. So this will actually take me to the next sort of side note that I was thinking about this. And this is sort of a sort of what also is one way to upgrade. If you've got an existing web forms application, you, I don't know if anyone's uh, got any web forms left. I know some some companies still use this quite a lot. 
And the way it was done with postbacks and update panels and all that sort of concepts. Well, Razor, uh, Blazor is sort of modern version of web forms. You still have postbacks because it opens a connection with the server. So when you click a link, it sends a postback via this connection, this WebSocket, and the server will respond with the chunk of HTML. And uh, rather than doing posts and submits on forms, this one is able to replace far less um, HTML. It's much more performant, but it's the same idea. So if you have an existing uh, WebForms application using Blazor, if you follow the links on that slide, you can actually check out some work that's been done, uh, as well as that nice ebook to say, okay, I've got this existing WebForms. How can I migrate to Blazor? And you can do it in a migration process rather than doing once off. And this is really cool. You can get all the features of the performance, the modern programming language, modern tooling, while still uh, in the migration process. So that's definitely something to check out. Um, yeah, and all that cool stuff about doing the websites and components and stuff, this also runs 100% the same, or not 100%, the, the coding is the same, but the, the framework is slightly different, but allows you to run directly on a client. So if you've got a, a web, modern web browser, which is pretty much all of them except IE, I think, um, it allows you to say, okay, I don't need to talk to the server. I want to run all the stuff just like you would with a Angular app or, or some sort of single page app uh, with JavaScript and CSS, but I don't want to use that. I want to use C Sharp. And Blazor allows you to take an entire website with navigation, dependency injection, all those features using C Sharp and .NET to run in the user's web browser. This is offline and it's uh, pretty cool that everything's on the clients. Right, so I thought- it's there's a question for you. Ooh, is yes. this the end of the controller? Uh, is this the end of the controller? I believe I and that must be related I, to MVC controller. Yes, um, I think it's a, just different. Uh, I mean, there's no need to re remove controller. I think that's still quite a, in fact, the Razor pages is an extension of controller that was introduced with .NET, you know, the one of the recent .NET. So I don't think um, the controller is going away. In fact, this probably is using the controller under the hood because this is this is basically it, it's not uh, it, it's an extension of ASP.NET. So the MVC runs on top of ASP.NET, Blazor runs on top of ASP.NET. So these are sort of different ways of doing websites. Um, yeah. So it's it's not like the end. It's like okay, Blazor's V3 of of the web. So therefore, all the stuff is gone. It's more like okay, people like this alternate, and if everyone uses this and nobody uses MVC, then MVC probably won't get you know new features. But if everyone says okay, I like MVC, you know, and I like Blazor, then you know support has to be on both because it's basically driven by what people have been asking for. So it's not the end, but. If nobody uses MVC again, then maybe it is, uh, if this is so cool. <laughs> so it's up to you. Do you want it to be the end? Uh, and, uh, and also there's, there's, there's millions of people probably still using MVC. So let's know, we, we, when, I, when you say the end, we're talking like, even if it is the end, it's like 10 years time. You know, so uh, so definitely uh, this is rather a, a different version. And the, and the difference between uh, MVC, one reason why you might not want to use MVC is um, because MVC is sort of like postbacks and stuff. You've got views and you switch between views, whereas this one is, is uh, and we're talking like little diffs of HTML that get sent back and forth or process. So if you click a button, it doesn't have to do a postback, doesn't have to ask the server to, you know, reinflate controllers and all that stuff. So uh, this is probably more performance and just a better development experience as well. So. You know, it's, it's up to you, really. So, but enough about slides. I don't know why I've been talking for so long on slides. I don't even really like using slides. So let's go into some code. I've got a slide for code. <laughs> oh gosh, everything is frozen. I don't know, like that. It's sad feelings in my heart. Oh no, I have I stopped this. I see Derek is using web forms still. Yeah, and, and definitely you can check out the, um, the links and see maybe Maybe you can migrate. I don't know. Obviously, company policy. I have quit the slideshow, as you may not have known, but I think my laptop didn't quite register that yet. I, so, I see a Windows logo. Okay. Can you see Visual Studio? I can see Visual Studio, yes. Okay, cool. So I, I have gone ahead uh, and created a, um, a webs, uh, couple of projects here that I'm going to show. So I'm just going to show you some 
which is the server side. So this is the typical default um, Blazor application. This is the Hello World template. Let's make it nice and small. And I'm going to show you something pretty cool of the way it works, then I'll show you some code. Uh, well, well let's, let's show you the code, then I'll, sh I'll show you how it is just pure magic. So let's say I've got this page and I have a counter and I click the counter, right? A typical website, you would have some stuff happening. And uh, obviously what I'm going to show you now can be done in JavaScript to count, but let's just say you, you need to update the server based on, on the counter, right? Let's say you've got six and seven. You want to do that. You want the server to know about that number. So you could um, you know, use JavaScript just to be on the client, but let's say you want the server to know, and I have gone ahead and have this awesome page that has some cool stuff in it. So this is pure Razor. There is no code behind. There is no view controllers. There is no um, uh, no well, controllers on iOS. It's just controllers, and there's no models and stuff. So this is what I've done. Is okay. I decided I want a page, and this page is going to be go to the slash uh, counter, and then this is my content. Now, if you look at that web page, let's put it side by side. So we can look at some awesome. Um, oh, I saw Alan there for a second. Uh, yeah, let's just make this. Oops, oops. Okay, so uh, that's very exciting. You don't need that. So I've got a counter page, and you can see I've got a, a header bar and a menu and everything here, but there is no menu in this. And that's what I was talking about components. This counter page is a component that fits in to other parts. For example, here is the host page. Now this host page is the sort of the core HTML and some cool features here and there. And then, you know, uh, that razor page is, uh, whoops, like for example, here's a, I'll click the link, my mouse moved. So here's sort of the application logic. It's all built up. So the host page is made up of the main layout page and the main layout. So, okay, here's a nav menu. Uh, this is what the navigation menu looks like. Here's some cool logic. Here's some logic to collapse and expand. And this thing is really cool because it's actually swapping out a CSS style. So if you look at where it's being used, so it's just adding a class. And with that counter, you know, so what's happening here, when I click the button on my, on my thing, it's, it's changing a CSS class. And when I go to my button and I click the counter, I'm actually running some sort of arbitrary uh, C sharp code. In fact, if I go over to my fetch data, here's a table with some cool stuff. And again, this is going off. Um, I'm using dependency injection with services. And this is the cool thing about uh, about the, the whole Razor syntax, just mix it all. You know, Some people like separate your the things, but this is all related to, to displaying stuff on a page, you know, and you can override sort of lifecycle events just as you would with like on web forms to say, okay, I've got the, you know, oh, I forget them all. I used to do it, but now it's a long time ago. I've blocked it. Um, and then all the lifecycle events when I mean, it's rendering and pre-rendering and stuff. So you could intercept these calls and do some work. So in this case, when the page is initializing, use a synchronous wait, hit the scorecard service, which is going to potentially be a database, and then load some stuff. So just like you would in, in, in most web development, you, you, you query it. But the nice thing is that it's all in one place and you can use models. There's a lot of cases where you might want to use models, but in this case, you don't have to. And this is the cool thing about it. But let's just I sort of rather than talking about some stuff, let's have a look at just something I found that was pretty interesting. I knew I was doing it, but I'd never actually investigated like what was actually sending. So let's go over to I don't know what's cool. Uh, let's go to counter page. OK, let's open the uh, F12. There we go. Whoop, whoop, whoop. It's slow, it's slow. Give me a second. OK, so this is the, the server application. And if I hit refresh, I should see a whole bunch of cool stuff loading here. And basically, the counter page, if we check out the preview, this is a pre-rendered from the server. My HTML page, as you would expect, obviously, it's got no styling right now. Uh, of, of the website, right? This is normal stuff. It's got a menu, it's got styling. Here's the CSS and the bootstrap. This is normal stuff. But then this is one cool thing that opens up is this Blazor um, message queue. So let's just see it's sitting up, it's doing some stuff. But what's really happening is if I, let's just make sure I, I've got the preserve log on so you can see I'm not cheating. Um, if I go ahead and click the button, right? I hit the server and the way it's done that is by just using this open web socket. And when I click that button, right, rather than in, let me copy this so we can see, copy that base64. 
And I copied this cool little app that I whipped up overnight running on .NET Core, WPF app. Um, paste that in there. Okay, this is the worst example. Um, you know what? Let's show you something really cool rather. Well, let's just do that. So I know, for example, if you see over there, there's number one, right? So this is obviously just buffer stuff around it because it's doing other stuff. But if I go ahead and click that a couple of times, and then I see it's just commuting over there, no postbacks, no need to refresh. If I paste that in there, you can see that there's number eight there now. Um, so basically what's happening is when I click the button, it's talking to the server, the server sending me results back. So if I go ahead and I am looking for uh, the menu, let's make that nice and small, and I'll show you something pretty cool. So let's just clear this. Now, as you see, this is what my page looks like, the closed menu, and I open the menu, I send a message to the server saying, hey, in fact, let me show you that, it's pretty cool. Uh, and this is how they got the stuff. So if you're making a website and you, uh, with that, and you can see it's, it's a base 64 version of some JSON content that's saying, hey, this is where you clicked on the screen. So if you wanna make an application that wants to know what the user is doing, you've got all this, and then the response, somehow the service worked out, okay, you click the menu, and then here is the new the new content. Uh, basically, what it's done is it's setting the class to nothing, right? That's why you can see it. And if I click it again and I get that downloaded message, oops, wrong side. And there we go, the class, and now it's got collapse. And that's this. This I thought was really cool is that I'm doing all this work that's 100% running on the server, but it's communicating over Signal R very quickly. And uh, it's allowing that that minimal um, uh, work, uh, content being sent back and forth. So even if I switch a page now, for example, let's say I switch to the counter page, right? There is that single response, no need for the page to change. And if I open that uh, this thing again and have a look, it's quite small as text. Um, I should have made the text bigger. And as you can see, it's just loaded. Here's the H1, here's the paragraph of the count. So it's literally just swapping out this content. So can you, can you zoom? Can I zoom for the that little application? Yeah, that, that text is quite small. Okay, let's just open Notepad because that's where Did all the cool have, things happen. Didn't you install Zoomit? Ah, yes, like a noob. Control four. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. As you can see, it's much better now. I'm assuming you can see sort of the HTML. So it's not perfectly formatted because this is obviously decoded as in a binary format but obviously text can't be converted into something that's less than text. Um, so as you can see that, so that's just the heading one. If there's no menu bar, there is no uh, you know, sidebar being loaded. So that's a pretty cool thing about the components because the, the Blazor knows about components. It knows, I just need to swap that out. And that, that's pretty cool. So if you're making an app for very performance, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, I thought that was cool. I probably shouldn't have wasn't technically useful to anyone, but I thought that was cool. So I thought I'd share that. And if you want to see just sort of how the, how it works, it's just it's just opening a web socket and that's how it communicates back and forth. And it's, and it's swapping out just the diff of the content. And uh, that's that's pretty exciting stuff. But also this exact same app, which you can see, for example, if I open my page and I open these pages and I say, okay, here's a counter page. And then I open another counter page you saw nothing change really. And here is my, um, like here's my, I don't know, let's do index page. And here's another index page. You don't see any difference. Well, the fact is I'm using the same code and I have also, if I have the right screen, this is a WebAssembly application. Now this is even more cool than uh, sending minimal messages back and forth between the server because this does not require a server and this is the awesome awesome thing about WebAssembly. you can run dotnet in your browser and not like okay i've got a dotnet website no this is dotnet in the browser and i can show you that so if i refresh that page you can see it's uh, got can i can i zoom this thing i've got that zoom so i'm basically downloading dotnet 3.2 i'm not particularly sure where 3.2 is maybe it's some special build of .NET that's loading, and I did not get my, oh wait, everything's probably cached. Can I clear the cache and just refresh that? Let's just use that, there's great control shift five or something. And I'm gonna show you that it downloads, oops, preserve log on, I don't need that. Why is it not downloading my DLLs? It's not working as I want it to. Oh. 
Okay, so it's clearly not listening to me. Um, I have no idea where it's gone. Here is my my DLLs. But anyway, it would have theoretically downloaded the DLL. So this doc, this is .NET running in the browser. Um, can I show you the WASM? No, okay, it's all binary filed up. It's gone now. It's gone. It was there with. They changed it for .NET 5. But anyway, you would get the, the web. So, so is, is that now .NET 5 or is it mono? This is, it must be .NET 5 because it used to have the mono and everything. Mm. Now, yeah, yeah, so this is that's pretty cool. So what's the cool thing about this is, is that if, well, this is offline uh, and I can click around and doing stuff. This is 100% running in a browser and it's loading the stuff. And I, I can turn off my, my internet and obviously this is local host, so that doesn't work. But if I was working outside the, uh, the, 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 if this was hosted, this wouldn't need, this would no longer need the internet. Obviously, to fetch the data, this would need it because it does a web request, as you can see with the weather, uh, the weather JSON request. But we no longer need the, um, the sort of the communication back and forth. There's no postbacks with the server. There's no signal R messaging. There's no request. OK, give me the page because this page is now rendered 100% on the client using WebAssembly and uh, the code itself is exactly the same. So this this is pretty cool. So you can take your application and if you make in libraries or you body components as part of an application, let's say it's a massive enterprise application and you decide, hey, I want to switch from the from client, client server architecture to WebAssembly, those components work. You can just switch over as is, and uh, obviously certain things will have to change. You can no longer, as I showed on the custom page, this is where my, my local directory is, and that's where my server lives in the browser. But if I go to custom on, you know, this is the C users Matthew documents, right? So it's the same code, but because it's running in a different place, you have to be aware of that. But you can take the same code and run it. The same code that defines the counter or some sort of advanced, um, you know, login uh, form and stuff you would still send messages back and forth but you would do that say okay i have to say use a web request a web service versus a direct link to the database for example on the server client side you could just say okay when i click the counter add a new record in the database whereas on the, the client server architecture you click the button it would say okay um send an http message to a web service somewhere and those can all be abstracted away with the services but the code that generates the pages the navigation the dependency injection all work just fine in fact on the WebAssembly project i'm injecting uh, http client which is not so exciting but um and here is a, a normal http web request that you can use to generate that page so that's that's pretty cool and this this is this is nice i know lots of some people have been using razor and and, and obviously asp.net so that's pretty cool but um, I thought, you know, uh, with Blazor, because it technically can run anywhere, I will just skip those slides. We can just go straight to what happens now if I want to do a mobile app. Obviously, this will run in a mobile website. You can just go to www.mycoolwebsite.com and you will get the, uh, this cool web app. But what happens if you actually want to make a native mobile app? You can you write it in you know, Xamarin Forms or you can use Blazor on mobile. And um, in fact, you know, let's do a couple of slides. I want to show you some code. It's the next slide, so I don't have to wait too long. And I, I think mobile apps are cool. Um, I don't know, I'm sure everyone on the call has a phone. Some people have no laptop, but have a phone. So mobile is cool. Um, but, you know, you want to write a cross-platform app, but you you come from a web, a web, uh, web space. Now you've maybe made an ASP.NET website. Maybe you've got a Blazor app that runs. Well, with mobile blazer bindings, this is still experimental, but it's something that, that we're looking at at Microsoft, and this is probably going to be part of the Maui sort of thing, because uh, right now it's based directly on top of Xamarin Forms, which is not the greatest in the terms that Xamarin Forms is designed for XAML. However, it still is really, really cool. That allows us to use Razor to, uh, and all the, uh, the hosted app model and the, the dependency injection, all the stuff that you saw in the single file, but still write a native app. And that's sort of weird to get your head around. But let's let's have a look at a tiny snippet of code before we, we go totally crazy. Um, 
So for those of you who've done uh, Xamarin Forms, there's a content page and stack layout and labels and buttons. And for those who've done like WPF, this looks somewhat familiar. You've got a XAML page, but this is not XAML, this is HTML, which is weird. Um, but it's still the same structure, right? Using the same things, just like when I was doing the website with a, a P and an H1 and an H2 and an unordered list and the list item, right? Those are elements. So with Razor, we're using elements, but this one, these are different elements. So you won't have a paragraph in a in a mobile app. There's no such thing as a paragraph native control. However, there's a label native control. So you can use the exact same razor. If you look over here, we've got some, uh, I can use a little doc feature on, um, oops, my monitors are all wiggy wiggy. Uh, laser pointer, look at this, little sparkles. Like I can write inline C sharp code. Here is like a little cool little C sharp expression. And not only that, I can have a link to buttons and run in line with my things. So I know a lot of people are saying, oh, XAML is limited because you can only do stuff. You know, I don't want to make a converter for everything. Well, you don't have to make a converter for everything anymore because, you know, you could try using something like that. Or, you know, you want to have, uh, you don't want to have a view model and you don't want to have code behind. Well, you can use the, the code blocks and code everywhere in this thing and just, just build the system. In fact, you'll see with my demo, um, which will be coming up soon. In fact, I'll come back to Razor Mobile Blow, the hybrid ones, and let's have a look at the code, and I can show you exactly what I mean by just, just mix it all. I mean, I know this is counter to the, the world. However, you know, let's go to the counter page and see why it's not counter to the world. So here's a counter application, as I had on the slide, and I have the, as I've shown, the um, sort of this is, this is what you would have to use a converter or some sort of string binding something. You know, uh, this will have to be like a command and you would have to have a view model, make sure you link it up and create a new command and link to the method. But how about just reference, but not, not even that. Even more exciting is I no longer have to worry about the I notify property change event. In fact, let me show you what it looks like when it runs. Now, obviously I would love to debug live and just click around, but unfortunately this laptop cannot handle the power of the debugger. Um, so, <laughs> So here is, here is this app. In fact, let me show you this homepage, right? Some crazy stuff going on. So I have a, um, uh, 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 just a page and, and I have some, you know, text, there's a label, let's move this to the side. And I've got a label and I've got this, this is a separate control, which I'll have a look in a second. But how about this text at the bottom? This is using Xamarin Essentials, just in line. It's like, it's just there. It's, you know, you're no longer like, OK, view models. There's no need for like, how do I put this in the code behind? You just, just straight in line, use native stuff. And it's not like, oh, I'm using HTML and I have to sort of do something fancy to try and access this, you know, native. Like this is just running natively on the on the web. Okay? It's not emulated. It's not hosted. It's not a web browser that's creating text. This is literally a shell application that I can show you here. You may recognize if you do Xamarin Forms, for those of you who don't know, it's just a um, sort of a new way of doing navigation and, and, and structure your app. But here is a shell application. Here is shell content. For those of you who've done Xamarin, this is like what you have seen. If you haven't seen Xamarin Forms, definitely go check it out. It's the greatest thing. Write an application, run it almost everywhere. And uh, you can build it up. So here it is. I've if for, to build this up. I've literally um, just reference native code. And if I go to that counter to show you that inline um, uh, that was using the new gradients for those of you who love gradients using gradients, which is added to Xamarin Forms. Like here is this counter. When I click this button, the number counting up. There's no notify property change. I'm literally just setting. This is marked as a field. You know, there's no special magic. It's just. It just works. I don't know how it works. It's just magic. Like, why would it even know <laughs> that a field needs to be updated? It's just obviously engineering went into that. But just from from an outside, it's like that is cool. And there's no work. And making the app like this uh, uh, is 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 very cool. And you can build it up. You can make custom controls. Like here is a, a library. Oops, I should have deleted that. That's no longer needed. But okay, so that exists. Um, here is a custom control, and if I navigate to that custom component, which I have in a separate library, which you can do as well, like here is that um, that survey prompt that we just saw on the home page. Um, whoops. Custom page. Here is a text in a button. Here's some text. All this, right? This is using system environment get folder path to get my documents. I'm running some 
a uh, parsing of colors there. All this stuff is just being used in the, uh, oops, let me click that link, in the custom control. So this is just normal as you were doing Blazor. This is normal sort of Razor syntax. You can make a fully native mobile application and uh, you, know, you can access all things like, oh, I want to access the GPS example in here and you would go like for example uh, geolocation um oh, geolocation dot um get get location asynchronous right this is going to spin up the the gps and and ask for um you know okay give me the location you know show a pop-up and, and all that all that you would do in xamarin forms all that you would do in the native android application or ios application you you access this directly in the page so that's super exciting and if you don't like view models and and all that sort of separation this is definitely something to do however if you do want is, the separation, is that using um xamarin essentials Yes, yes, this is using Xamarin Essentials. I had to use that in this application because you know I work on that. So Xamarin Essentials is pretty cool. It I can fact I can show you. Uh, can I show you what it looks like inside that DLL? Does anything pop up? No, nothing pops up. Can I open that? No, they don't have a cool browser. They need to have that in um, Edit. Uh, as Visual Studio for Mac has, but it's it's Xamarin Essentials is basically the native library. So we've written the library to say, OK, how do we access the GPS on Android and iOS? And you have to do it all different ways. So we've wrapped that in a pure .NET standard DLL, which you can run anywhere. And now I'm just using it in line in this Razor page. So I've got a mobile application, as you as you saw for my screen share. This is a, a Xamarin Form shell application. It's a native Android application. It's not like a hybrid. It's not like a web view that has content. This is a genuine um, mobile application using native this is a native you know android toolbar you know so this is really really cool and i am super excited about that and just i i think i would rather do this than xaml i know it's probably sacrilege somewhere um but just writing this and for example if i look at my application the cool thing is if you know asp.net this is using the the host border model and we can do like okay i want to do i think we can just do add configure logging right and you just hook up your your native logging you know all the stuff that you would know and and do in your uh in your asp.net layout so this is this is really exciting and i'm sure this is gonna go places so definitely head over to um let me go back to my slides so I can get that link. This uh, Moza Blazer, uh, Moza Mobile Blazer bindings and and this links docs. Just get get there. Leave your uh, leave your comments, views. There's examples out on the web. There's links from the docs there. So definitely, I think that's that's super exciting. I am. I think this is the new thing. I I think I like this more than XAML. Um, so I hope this is becomes the new new stuff. Um, but but I know what you're thinking. Of. Okay, that's cool. We can make mobile apps. We can use Razor. That's exciting. You know, you can share code with the server and the client. Uh, but how about this? You have a Blazor application, and now you want that Blazor to run on mobile, but you also want to be able to access native libraries, right? You 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 had this lots of money and time you spent on making an awesome website, but now you also want to run it on mobile. You want a mobile app. Well, you could just use a, a hosted web app, like a little web view or something. But how about this? Running Blazor on the mobile app, you know, just like we did on ASP.NET uh, uh, WebAssembly, we run it, but this is slightly different. We're gonna go nuts. We're actually gonna run it on the, as if it was a mobile app, it's just crazy. So it's, this is also, this is an experimental, experimental thing. It's like a double experimental. I should have had double there, but it's literally saying, okay, I'm gonna have a native app. I'm gonna run Blazor somewhere, but I'm also, going to be a native application. This means I'm going to be running one runtime, one shared process. So if I have an object that exists in the Blazor application, for example, the counter, that counter can access, be accessed outside the Blazor application. And in fact, let me show you this crazy stuff, right? Yes, I'm, I don't know why I've got the slide. It's not very really exciting, but OK. It's got a stack layout. I've got a Blazor web view. And in that Blazor web view, I'm literally hosting my web application. Now, obviously, this is a demo, and I had to recreate this last night uh, from scratch, even though it's actually a file new template. But uh, I thought, you know what? Let's just go straight into the, the cool and exciting code. So first off, if I minimize this and let's zoom in with that zoom it. Um, 
if I press, I just click, there we go. So this part, right, uh, you can use like refer linking and stuff, but this part, whoops, is the, um, is the mobile application. This is what you would have on a Blazor application. In fact, you can see the counter, you can see the main layout, you can see the app, the, the nav menu. This is Blazor Blazor, the, the real Blazor. And then this bit uh, at the bottom here is the mobile app. So obviously this one is showing, the sample was showing more of the Blazor being used and they didn't spend too much time on the mobile app. Uh, because this was made by the Blazor team, but I think I need to get the forms team to show them just how cool this is. So if you have a Blazor application, you can use Blazor. So let's let's have a quick quick squiz in that before I have to give back to Alan and he has to take control and share some cool IoT stuff. So here he is. Um, in fact, before I even show code, let's just show you what it looks like. I mean, who cares what it code looks like until we see it and we can see some even more magic. So this app doesn't look too wow. But, um, for example, here's my Blazor application. Here is my message saying, you know, I'm running an older version of uh, uh, my, the version of Android using native APIs. Now I can use the fetch data, so everything still works. But this is the special page, right? So, so the index page was using native APIs, but that's exciting. We've seen that it's done. But how about this? So this part is a native Android application. This is no no web view here. This is pure. Whoops. What? Why would it disappear on me? I didn't know right click did that. Um, so this is native application and this, this is your Blazor application. This would be your existing application on your server and you can intercept links and stuff. So you can click on a link here. In fact, this will pop up a website, right? This is using um, in, in line with HTML. Let me show you that page. This is pretty cool. Uh, so bad prompt. In line of HTML, right? This is, this is raw HTML with classes and stuff. I've got, okay, click this button and then use a native API. I mean, you can't say that's not cool. Oops, survey's closed. Okay, so why they give me an old link? But okay, but let's go back to the counter application. So I'm interacting stuff here. If I click this button, one, two, three. Okay, that's cool. We know how to send messages, but let me show you what the message looks like. So I'm using dependency injection right now to inject a single object, and then I use... Um, the counter, uh, when I click the button, the HTML button, I click the button, it goes over to F12, that puppy, goes over to this single C sharp object, and this one is doing some incrementation, uh, incrementing, and then it updates some state and all that stuff, and then the HTML page, we go back there, is is basically triggering this uh, state has changed, but obviously, you know, you don't have to write this and all your stuff, you can abstract this away and whatnot. But this is an HTML button in a web view that's pushing a button that's interacting, not via messaging, not via JSON, not via some binary serialization, directly with, if I click on, is it app? No, where's my page? Main page, there we go, right there at the bottom. With this Xamarin Forms or native uh, button, which again is using some string interpolation inside Razor, it's just like, it's just mash it all together, people. <laughs> I don't know, I think this is so cool. So if you have a website that exists and you're using Blazor or you're wanting to have a look at Blazor or you want to choose, should I use Blazor? Blazor is definitely one way in which you can say, okay, it doesn't matter anymore. I want to make my website either using Razor with, um, with, with a native app or I, I haven't had the time to spend the necessary you know, effort to, to create the mobile app. Let's take um, our existing mobile app and not worry about, okay, you know, how can I do certain things? You can just integrate directly, like for example, with the, um, like what I've got, let's say the, the, the Hello World, it's not like, super exciting, but if we go to that survey prompt, I just directly use the native one. In fact, if you have um, the fetch data, right, I am doing some sort of cool uh, initialization here, but you can totally hit like get the location using you know i don't know geolocation dot get current location that will pop up a native dialogue it's just super exciting just mix it all together and i and i you know i just <laughs> just wanted to share that with everyone i had some real fun looking at that and i probably have to stop speaking because it is getting late Whoop. um yeah so this is exciting and it's just all the, it's all the features you get with with ASP.NET, and that's even more exciting. Like the dependency injection, the the uh, the cool the cool things. So definitely really exciting just to be able to just mash it all together and say, okay, what am I? Um, 
what do I want to use? I'm making a mobile app. I want to use some sort of um, uh, native stuff, but I also want to use um, you know, all the features of ASP.NET and the, and the Blazor using dependency injection and all that. It's just, just mix it all together. Really, really exciting. And I have some sort of animation and I keep forgetting. Um, I have the link to the demo. And I will just skip over, or let's just go straight to show some cool stuff that I thought I'd just quickly mention for if you are using Blazor or you want to see some cool stuff. So there were some cool new things in Blazor, uh, such as the CSS isolation, auto refresh, you know, better debugging, like you can actually debug in Visual Studio, you press F5, you can debug in WebAssembly, really, really cool, as well as some just massive improvements in the performance, in the compatibility and the pre-rendering. For example, you want to go to a website, you don't want to have to load the blank page and then it loads data later. You can tell the server, give you the full data so that um, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, delays on the user's sort of perception, as well as some things like lazy loading. So if you're using WebAssembly when there's like hundreds of DLLs, you don't have to download all of them in one go. You just uh, pull down the three you need and then you slowly pull down at, on each request if you need them. And for the mobile side, other cool things, um, you can use this via um, desktop apps. So if you're going to make a Mac OS app or a WPF app or for Windows desktop, uh, you can also do exactly that. That was a sample. I just needed the Windows and the Mac because I wanted to show off Android and iOS. Uh, and the cool thing is, if you click a link, it's the same navigation. It's because it's one process. When something happens in Blazor, Blazor can say, okay, I'm navigating. Oh, I detected a shell page for, for a native page. So don't load a web page. Load, go to the shell, go to the, not the shell, go to the native uh, activity or, or in the case of iOS, like the, the view controller. So all that amazing stuff, just absolutely cool. I'm, I'm really excited. I really love this. And I thought I'd quickly just rush through, show you all the little bits, some of the cool new things in uh, Blazor. And uh, I think I've rambled a bit. I didn't really look at any questions. I just forgot that I was on a call, actually. <laughs> I was like, oh, look at this code. So let me see what people have been saying. Um, OK. All right. Oh, we've, we've got um, somebody here that loves the idea of Blazor, but have Silverlight PTSD. What do you ah, think of Silverlight, Matthew? Silverlight. Oh, I, I, my first job was Silverlight. Let me turn this camera on. Cam. Okay. Uh, voices. There's a camera. Let's turn that off. We don't need to have any slides. Okay. I think I might have totally moved my laptop to my excitement here because this picture looks different. Okay. Um, uh, so with Silverlight, Silverlight is pretty cool in the, the fact that it was an idea to say, okay, I want to make a website uh, or a web application and I want to have C Sharp and, and .NET and I don't want to worry about JavaScript and stuff. No, so I just want to mention this before I talk about Silverlight is that you can still use JavaScript and CSS. This is not like a replacement. It's, a, it's, it's better, obviously, than JavaScript. But hey, sometimes you have to do something with JavaScript. So the interop is like super easy. Uh, I didn't mention it because I... Didn't think it was important when I was creating that this sample, but clearly it is because there's lots of web stuff out there. Um, but it's totally it works there, and that was the Silverlight was as well. It's like I'm making a website, but I also want to work with HTML and create a web uh, HTML page. Maybe uh, in the case of Silverlight, it rendered the entire thing. But in the modern world, people don't like that. They don't like Flash. They don't like Silverlight. They want to have like this is my website. I don't want plugins. Don't want extensions. And that's the the cool thing about um, uh, uh, Blazor is that it's it's not. It's literally using uh, HTML elements in the browser and it's not like, okay, I have to install a plugin or an extension. This is based on, it's literally running .NET on WebAssembly. So what that means is, uh, let's break into the layers. So there's a web browser. The web browser run has a support for WebAssembly, which is a, a standard. And that standard is nothing tied to do with Microsoft. It's not tied to do with anything in .NET. In fact, it is so generic that you can write a Rust app that will compile down to WebAssembly. You can write a, I don't know, C++ app. In fact, um, with, with the one on the slide, the uh, Blazor, uh, for example, could support uh, something like Skiershark or SQLite Net. Uh, well, not SQLite Net, so SQLite. And that is a C++ application that can run on WebAssembly. In fact, for Skiershop, I actually have a couple of unit tests that run in the browser on WebAssembly. There is no .NET 
need it. I, I, I use .NET because I like that, but I p invoke into native lines. So it's not like something I've added to the browser and this could go away. It's, it's a web standard, so it can't go away at this point. Uh, you know, it, it just as like, okay, the web browser supports CSS, it supports JavaScript, well, it also now supports WebAssembly. So um, the PS, the PSD, the uh, PTSD that you have, uh, you know, Microsoft moved your toys, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think this is better in the sense that there is no plugins, no extensions, and this is very popular, very cool, and uh, I hope that you know the P PTSD goes away. Because I know I when I when I was doing my first job, I was like, oh, and this is so awesome. It's like, no, not learn HTML. Whereas this one is, um, it's literally running ASP.NET on top of .NET on top of WebAssembly in the browser, and WebAssembly is a browser standard that Google and like Firefox and all of those people support. And then .NET is an open source cross-platform development tool that compiles down to a C library, which runs on WebAssembly, right? Because .NET is literally a C runtime. And Blazor is just a couple of .NET DLLs. So you can make it, like in fact, I have a website, uh, not a website, a web app that doesn't use Blazor. It just uses a .NET console app to, to do it. So when you write console.writeline, it writes to the, the, the browser log. And that's the thing is that the Blazor is just, it's just a framework on top. So if Blazor, something ever happens, a Blazor goes away, well, .NET will still be there. I know .NET will still be there because I'll still be doing .NET and WebAssembly will still be there because, you know I mean? The amazing performance of WebAssembly, it just can't be rivaled. You can't do anything faster in JavaScript if you would do it, you obviously write bad code, but you know, because it's a native component, so you get all that amazing performance. So it's not gonna go away. And uh, as Neil says, I can tell my thing to be offline. I don't know if that was a good explanation, Derek. That was just me rambling. I was like, no, <laughs> Silverlight's cool. Everyone who said it was bad, they didn't know how awesome it was. And uh, yeah, so Silverlight's cool. And uh, this is this is way better. I, I think Blaze is cool. I think Blaze on mobile is cool. I love my XAML. I'm an old, old fashioned guy. Like, ah, oh, XAML's the way to do it, you know? But if I think back, I was doing uh, WinForms and also WebForms with the whole event model and the postbacks and the, you know, code behind and then I was able to move to to XAML and view models and I think I think this is the next iteration it's you know it's still separate it's sort of like a, a mix between the MVU and the um and the sort of the XAML XAML is everything separate MVU is just everything's code but this one is like let's do both and I think that's why it's so cool uh but geez how long was that talk I've no long I've rambled Alan's yeah, probably going to there's another question minutes. That's, that you probably have touched on and answered. Um, seeing it's HTML elements, um, mm -hmm. can, are you able to use Material Design Bootstrapper? For Blazor? For Blazor, yes. Yes, yes, yeah, I just picked that. That was a default theme, but that's just, that is stock standard uh, Blazor application. You, you can use, it, it's literally yeah, HTML elements. So you can make a website doing look anything you want. And with the mobile app as well, uh, that is literally running in a web browser or a sort of a web view if you're doing the hybrid one. So you can also use the uh, any CSS framework. You can even use things like Blazor, like, okay, you wouldn't want to, but let's say you love Angular and you just want to mix the worlds, don't do this. But if you really, really want to, you can do that because Blazor is just outputting HTML. So, you know, Mixing it. If you've got some cool a JavaScript library with some CSS styles that you want to use, Blazor outputs HTML, which can you know run JavaScript. So you know if you let's say you've got some cool date picker that, as I mentioned, you can just say okay, click the button, trigger, call some JavaScript method. It will go ahead, do the pop up, you know, do some cool stuff, and you don't have to worry about like how does it work, how does it interrupt with Blazor, because when they say the user picks the date, you'll get the same events to happen, the same events that are picked up. By, um, by, by, by by the HTML elements in JavaScript, the sort of standard HTML events or DOM events, and that is that can be routed back to to Blazor. Then you can respond to that your your side. So yeah, it's just it's just awesome. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Like everything just... is awesome. Yes, everything is awesome. Yeah. It's Blazor all the things. There's no more questions that I see. Uh, 
All right, I think. No, no, no more questions. Okay, I think we can hand over to Alan. He can share some exciting running. Like I, I was talking about .NET on the web and on mobile, but it's going to take it to the next level. This is going to run on like at least a silicon. Um, All right. I actually have no idea how I'm going to follow these two talks. <laughs> so, oh, no. so, so let me try. Sorry. But cool, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Right, so I'm going to continue the story um, of sharing code and .NET code with other platforms. Let me just get my screen shared. Okay. You're going to have to do that. I'm my presenter. Okay. Oh, just remember, you are now producer. <laughs> oh, don't don't I, forget me. I can't. Okay. I can't see that. I've got the old UI. Okay. So do I have to produce myself? Yeah. Yeah. All that power. Okay. Well, well, hopefully you can see see my, yep. my uh, slides shared, and also Matthew, please keep that um, technical difficulty slide handy. <laughs> you know what happens. <laughs> anything <laughs> yeah. can go wrong. Anything can catch fire. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you for everyone that's that's attending today. It's been a really really cool day. Um, I know I'm at the end of the day, so um, thank you for those that that um, stay to to see what I've got to say. So what I'm going to be talking about is extending your usage of .NET into other platforms. So one of the themes of that Scott was mentioning is use your skill um, to do different things and 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 leverage your skills to to work in areas that you don't normally work in, but you can take your .NET and your C Sharp skills with, with you. So this talk is very much about that. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Alan. Um, if you want to contact me, my Twitter handle is at ADP. And if you want to send me an email about anything, please keep it um, tech related because I'm not uh, very good at personal problems, but you can send me an email. My address is at the bottom. Okay. Right, so what's the agenda for this talk? Um, what can you do with .NET and specifically in IoT and in context of cross-platform development? So I'm very much into Xamarin Platform and been working in cross-platform um, development for, for many, many years, probably too many years to mention. Um, so what we're going to look at is extending beyond the usual platforms of, of code sharing. And we can use .NET and, and C Sharp and the languages that. Alan, did you put your slides yep. live? I see my face on the live stream. Um, I did. Uh, Let's have a look. I'm looking to see. There you go. Hello, people. Hope everyone's having a great evening. Let's have a look. It should be shared. I still got the red block around my body or the my image. OK, so let's have a look. Let's stop sharing. Let's reshare. What do you see in your view? I still got the, the red border saying I'm live. Um, I'm watching the live stream here, but I'm but seconds yeah. behind. Where's that technical difficulty slide? Okay, Are you, do you do you select the content? Yes, it should be live. Looks okay. live on my side. There we go. The block has moved. I think we are. I'll be following the stream. All right. Okay. So so can everyone see it now? Okay. Right. So. Right. So um, what we have here is all the platforms that that Scott was mentioning as well, what um, Matthew was mentioning too. So .NET is really a platform for building anything that you want in any any uh, guise or form. You can build desktop apps, you can build web apps like Matthew was showing Blazor. You can build mobile apps. So, so Matthew was also showing Xamarin and what you can build in Xamarin and things and games, AI, and IoT applications as well. So what we're going to be looking at is how we can leverage .NET 
specifically in IoT. But this diagram here, I've probably presented this uh, probably a couple of hundred times, and Matthew probably recognized this definitely. Um, when we speak about code sharing with C Sharp and .NET, we always use these block diagrams that we've got, and this comes from the Xamarin platform of all, and how we share code across multiple of these platforms. So, so Xamarin is .NET for, um, for uh, mobile devices. So what we have here in this diagram that we've got C Sharp, we can use an iOS devices. We've got C Sharp, we can use an Android devices. We've got C Sharp, which works on .NET. And we had some sort of form of sharing C Sharp code across those platforms. But there is much more to it than, than just the Xamarin platforms and things like that. So Matthew today showed that you could build stuff in C Sharp. You could run it, um, build stuff in C Sharp with Blazor and run it in WebAssembly in a browser. Um, you could, yes, use the Xamarin platforms. You could run things on Linux. Um, what what we could be doing is running things on, on Ubuntu or Raspbian or any of the, the Linux distributions. We could, we could be, and that's on the client side, on the server, we could be running things in the cloud. So we could be running C Sharp on a server in Azure. We could be running on a Linux box somewhere. Uh, we could be even, and it's not mentioned in the blocks there, we could be running on, um, on a Windows server on premise and things like that. But what, what we have here is the concept of sharing C Sharp across all these layers, client side, server side, and of course, sharing C Sharp code across both of them. So this, as Scott was mentioning, maximize the reuse of your skill because you know .NET, you know C Sharp, um, and you can also make things more productive as well because you can start sharing code across those platforms that you don't have to. And as, as Scott pointed out, reinvent the wheel and things like that. Right, so .NET has support for different processes. So it has the definitely the old support of x86 and uh, of course x64 uh, bits and things on Intel processors running on Windows. So the full framework and things always used to do that. Um, and of course, now you have all these ARM devices um, that could be lots of IoT devices, phones and things like that. There's support for that on .NET as well. So ARM devices are basically little low power computers. Um, they could be running Linux, Android. Um, your phone is a is an ARM device. Um, you can run Windows on ARM. Um, iOS devices also run ARM processes as well. And I'm sure everyone has heard by now Apple and the the Mac versions of the M1 processor, which is ARM as well. But some of these devices also allows you to interact with electronics, interact with hardware. Um, so in this in these diagrams and pictures here on the right, um, what we have there is is a Raspberry Pi. On the on the left is a Raspberry Pi 4. On the right is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, just different form factors, different performance, but they're all ARM processors. They allow you to interact with hardware. So of course they've got general purpose uh, in-out pins. Um, if you want to interact with electronics, it's got serial interaction via like things like I squared C buses and spy buses and things like that. Um, they have some sort of plug-in, like off the shelf plug-in uh, electronics as well. So like the device there on the right has what's known as a hat that plugs onto a Raspberry Pi. So you've got electronics composed into a board that you can just use. Other platforms call them shields, so Arduinos and things like that are, are, are known as shields. There's some other devices that's Feather and things like that, but they all have some sort of electronics that they connect to. And of course, if they connect to the internet, um, we can take information from all that electronics and sensors and things like that. And together with, with um, internet connectivity, we can then work towards the internet of things. So, an example of a ARM device that most people have is like a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's a ch very cheap computer as well. You can get them for, for 
probably uh, between about 400 uh, grand, depending on the specs, up to about a thousand. Um, and what these allow you to do is run mostly most of the distributions that work on it is Linux, but you can run Windows IoT on it as well. Um, but the important thing is it interacts with electronics and things. So what you see there is the pins that you can plug different things in and interact with hardware. And you can connect different different electronics to these um, devices. And this in in this case here, we've got a Fritzing diagram, which is just a uh, a way of drawing how you connect wires to components. And you can plug in different off the shelf components as well into these devices. And you can then infer information from these sensors. In this case, it's a temperature sensor. Um, and of course, every IoT solution has to have an LED. So on the right there, we've got an LED plugged in. Um, so in this way, you plug those uh, those little wires and components into these pins on a Raspberry Pi, and then you can interact um, with those um, with code that that is actually running on the on the device. All right. So when we build stuff for a for a Raspberry Pi or ARM devices, um, Visual Studio Code um, is a good thing to use. It's now fully supported by Microsoft to run on the device as well, so you can do development on the device. There's a myriad of languages that you could use as well. You could use Scratch, Python, HTML5, JavaScript, Java, um, but the big one there that, that we're focusing on in today's session is C Sharp. Um, because we're all about C Sharp today, and of course, .NET and .NET 5. Okay, so I'm going to show you some demos in, con content, uh, in context of some home automation um, demos that, that I've got to put together. Um, what I'm going to do is, is show you a native app interacting with the cloud in IoT Central, native app built in Xamarin using .NET. Um, I'm also going to show you how to sh uh, sh use the same code and share code between that and an IoT device on the right. So we've got an IoT controller, we've got a native app, and we can speak on the uh, via the cloud, via IoT Central. We could speak locally as well. And I did do a talk about this last week where I used Power Apps and, and an app as well to control my home network. Um, so if you want to know more about this architecture and how it comes together, that recording is available in, in Meetup as well. But this, in a nutshell, this is just an architecture that I have within my house, that I have a gateway that protects my devices within the, within the house, and I've got node red running as a gateway node red is a low code um, actually it's implementing javascript and node as a platform but it's a low code version of of mapping inputs from sensors and devices and message queues and things like that that you can visually represent them it's really cool um, and i have behind that what's known as mqtt which is a message queue uh, telemetry transport it's running on Eclipse's Mosquito, um, and that relays messages to different devices within my network. So in this example that I'm going to be showing today is just a simplified version of what my house is doing. Um, it has something known as Tasmata. Tasmata is basically ESP um, processes that you buy off the shelf. So I'm running Sonoff devices um, that you can just buy from, from a take a lot or a Pi shop or any of the, the, the retailers that sell the things. Um, and you can then use those to switch things on and off. What's nice about Tasmata is you disconnect that device from its manufacturer's services and they connect to the, uh, they connect to goodness knows where. So Tasmata actually is an open source firmware that makes you in full control, which is really, really cool. And I've got a couple of other things hooked up with air quality monitors and things for the office and all those type of things. Um, using IoT Central, IoT Central is Azure's low code um, also solution for, for IoT. It encompasses basically the Azure IoT reference architecture, so you don't have to. 
It's also implemented it as a software as a service, and it provides some really cool um, implementations that you don't have to know too much about IoT to get it to work. So that's really cool for the for the demo that I'm I'm going to be showing. But in essence, this is going to be doing stuff in my house. So Matthew, get the fire extinguisher ready and your technical difficulty <laughs> slide. Um, anything can happen. Right. Right, so let me show you some of the stuff. Yeah. Right, so what I have here is a Xamarin project. I chose to use, um, oops, I chose to use for this demo something known as um, Uno Platform. So Uno Platform is also um, a UI sharing platform similar to Xamarin Forms, but what's they've taken a different approach. You implement it as UWP, so you implement XAML. I'm sorry, Matthew, XAML is still cool. Um, you implement um, XAML as you would have done in the UWP plat uh, platform. But what's really nice about this is have a look at all the platforms that we can support as well. So those block diagrams that I had, there's actually much more that you can target too. So you could target GTK, which is um, a UI um, library for, for as actually a cross-platform um, UI library uh, that will run on Linux, it will run on Windows, it will run on Mac OS and things like that. You can run Windows Presentation Foundation. You can run UWP on, on Windows. You can also do what Matthew was showing in Blazor. You can run it as WebAssembly or WASM. And of course, you can run on all these these normal Xamarin platforms, which is draw, uh, Android, iOS, and of course, Mac OS as well. But what, what is nice about .NET is you've got all these cool packages and things, which is NuGet packages, and we can bring in things to speak to um, IoT Central and IoT Hubs. There's Microsoft Azure.Devices.Client that will speak to IoT Central. And it's got packages as well. So I'm speaking to my local network without leaving the network into the cloud using uh, system.net.mqtt to do that. Right, so let me run this and show you what it does. Okay, so we're just running this. Let me bring this up. Okay, so, so just while that's starting, um, what, what we have is a simple implementation of MQTT. So if I just had to go to the screens, uh, I'll just go quickly to this main page. All I've got is this IoT Home Hub um, class that I've got. And what I can do is when I press on a button, I can switch on a light. I can also switch on my aircon. So, so um, I suggest you close your ears because it, it might be loud. Um, and what happens here is all we're doing is we're sending messages via MQTT on, on, the, on my local MQTT bus. We can also relay that to Azure. So this is the, the simple application that I've got. Let me just show you what so I, so I've got over here. So I can just take my IoT device here. Uh, Matthew, you can see that on the on the live feed, right? Uh, I'm watching on my screen. I can see the pop-up yeah, okay, cool. there. Then, then it should be fine. So what? Okay. So what you're seeing here is a down a down view of a Raspberry Pi. So that's the Raspberry Pi four that I had in the slides. And what what's there is um, it all connected up. But what I'm going to now do is just from a Xamarin perspective, I'm going to click these buttons. So I'm going to press this turn light on. I'm going to get a message that's sent on the on my message queue, which gets relayed to my light. And we should have this horrible blue glow that's happening here. That's like my eyes. And if I switch on this aircon, what I've got is a very crude um, aircon unit just for demo here. It's a fan that runs. So if I click on this button that says turn aircon on um, and you'll see the camera is starting to vibrate because it's blowing quite hard. 
and I can switch things on and off, right? And I can switch the light off and it goes back to normal. So this is a, just a very simple implementation of a UI. It's got a, a class that we've got, which is C-sharp and .NET. We're utilizing our, our standard NuGet packages here in a mobile app. And we've got magic happening here with, with um, speaking to my house and controlling different devices in my house. Now, if I had to move on to an IoT device, so that IoT device there that's in picture, that is actually a Raspberry Pi. Now, I've, I've moved over to Visual Studio Code. I could have done this in Visual Studio 2019. I could have done it on the device as well. Um, but I've just moved to Visual Studio Code on my PC. And here I've got a just a .NET project that is uh, deployed to the, the, the Raspberry Pi. And we've got, it's just a normal .NET application. It's using just normal program and we've got our normal static uh, static main method and things like the, that. And then the camera is sort of covering the text. Now you can move to the other corner, that sort of preview. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, I'm not going to show too much code before I run it, but uh, let, let me move it over there. Is that better? Yes, that's that's much better. Okay. I'll make it smaller. I've got the power. Right. Okay, so, so this is just a normal console app that I've got. But what is really nice is we've got this target framework here. It is saying .NET 5, which, which means we can now also run .NET 5 on our Raspberry Pi. And what we also have is here we've got the package references. We can still use exactly the same stuff that I use in my Xamarin app. I can use my Azure Devices client. I can use my system.net or MQTT. Um, I can use also other things. So there's other packages I can bring in as well. And what, what um, Microsoft has done as well, it's there's also libraries that's provided to get to all those cool um, electronics as well on the device. So there's all those pins that you saw, there's GPIO, we can get to via system.device.gpio. We can also get to components within uh, that's higher level components. So GPIO is just basically switching on pins high and low and things like that. But of course you can then get a higher level component via drivers that's, that's within the bindings um, uh, package as well. So for example, over here, I've got this office environment controller. It reads from from some sensors. Um, I've got as I as I had in those diagrams a DHT11, which is actually just a, a very cheap and nasty um, temperature sensor. Um, I just got a fancy name for it called environment monitor. It re it reads basically um, humidity and temperature. So now this comes from a NuGet package that we can just bring into our application, which which is um, really nice. I can also send a message to. Um, I can also send messages to Azure, so I've got this client, which is a device client, which can send um, telemetry um, to the cloud in IoT Central. And then what is also quite nice is I can reuse my home hub automation that I had in a Xamarin app and I can just use it. I can use it directly as it as it was. So I can then also and I've got I could have made exposed this as electronic buttons, but I've exposed this as just keys I can press in a console because this is a console app running on a Raspberry Pi. But what I can now do as well is I can use that same implementation to switch on my devices in the in the house. So I can switch on my light, switch on my aircon, but I can do this now with the same implementation that I can share now from a mobile app through to um, an IoT device. Um, and we could also um, we could have also hooked it up into Matthew's cool Blazor app. We could have made magic happen there too. But let's have a look at this thing run. Yeah. 
So you also got some options here with Visual Studio Code. We could, could have run it on the device. We could do a remote deploy as well. Um, so in other words, build it on this machine, do a, a .NET publish. And what's nice about .NET publish is you can target different types of processes as well. So you could publish it on a running on a Windows machine. You can on a x86 machine. You can publish to ARM as well. So so you can then do a build as well. That's that's published to run on, on these different oops, on these different devices. Okay, but what I'm just going to do is I'm going to go to the device. And I'm going to do what I'm going to do what Scott does and do a .NET run. I've just opted to not build because it's just slightly faster. And what I've got here is the code that's running that's now connecting to an IoT hub. We've got some telemetry that's coming through. So at the moment, this office here is. 30.9 degrees Celsius, which is rather warm. I'm not sure, Matthew, what it's like on your side, <laughs> but it is quite warm here. And of course, we've got the humidity here that's 39% and things like that. But now what we could also do is reuse that implementation that we've got in a Xamarin app, and I could I could switch on the aircon, and hopefully you can see the, the message that went through. And here we've got this fan over here that's spinning. Um, we've also got that requirement for IoT, a flashing LED that's just a GPIO pin going high and low. And what we have there is magic happening. I can then go and go to my app and switch the light on and get blinded by the light. And here I'm just reusing that same message queuing that I had within the Xamarin app. And we've got the light that that's running. I can also then switch it off and and things like that. So here's just a, a, a very simple example of you reusing your skills. Um, you're a mobile developer. Now you're an IoT developer and you can get get some cool things to to have happen. But as I said, we are also sending this, this stuff to Azure. So we've got this IoT Central. So IoT Central um, is a very, very nice, easy um, uh, platform to get up and running with your IoT in the cloud. I've got this Raspberry Pi 4 environmental um, controller. IoT Central, you, you create templates. Templates represent a device. A template, for example, I've got this environmental controller. A template basically describes what comes out of the device or what a device does. So capabilities is reading from sensors on a device. I could send commands to a device. In other words, direct met method invocation on a device. So I could call code on a device. Um, or I could set properties, which is things like maybe fan speeds and, and all those type of things, which is settings that you can change on the device. And part of this template definition is also something known as views, so you can visualize um, what's what a device looks like as well. So I can I can just check layouts, drag and drop. So this makes life really easy if you want to create dashboards and things like that. So let me go and have a look at this environmental controller. This one is a Raspberry Pi 4, and what we have here is the telemetry coming out of the device. So we've got this temperature. If we give it some time, we'll get some some nice graphs that appear and things like that. But the important thing is we've got some telemetry streaming here from the device. So we've got the humidity and the temperature appearing all nicely within um, IoT Central. So part of the the .NET offering. There's SDKs as well for .NET to get to, to things like Azure IoT Hubs. Azure, to, Azure IoT Hubs is the core component that's running within this IoT Central as well. So just out of interest, um, I've got the Sonor Power R2, which is a, one of the Sonor off-the-shelf modules. This is running Tasmata, and I can model this also in IoT Central. So, so what we've got here is the a dashboard showing the power usage of that little aircon fan that I've got running as well. I can also see um, 
uh, the, the parent power coming out of it and things like that. We just needed to stabilize. Let's look at the raw data. And what we've got is the telemetry coming out of it, the, the current, the, the power factors and all those type of things. That's just out of interest. Nothing to do with .NET though. Right, let's go back to the slides. Yeah, so, so what we saw there was a Xamarin app. Um, we could use just standard NuGet packages. Um, we were running the system.net.mqtt just from, um, from NuGet.org, and we were using Microsoft Azure devices on the device. Then what we did was we did exactly the same thing, used the same stuff just on a Raspberry Pi. So reiterate that we're reusing our C Sharp skills or our .nickiness. Okay, so Raspberry Pi is also a lot more, it's an IoT device, but it's more like a small computer. IoT also really requires lower power devices. So what I mean is devices that don't need a lot of power that you can put in a, on a pole somewhere remote without power and you don't have to carry batteries to it like every day and things like that. So it can run on watch batteries for like six months to a year and things like that. So Raspberry Pi is not that. So Raspberry Pi, you need a, a quite a decent power source for it. Um, it will run a few hours on battery packs and things like that. You, for, what I call more real IoT, you need lower power devices. So, so these, so so there is a solution for that in the .NET space as well. There's a board from a company called Wilderness Wilderness Labs. Um, that's called the Meadow. The Meadow is actually one of these low power boards. The form factor, yeah, as I was mentioning previously, some use shields, some use hats. This is known as a feather board. So if you buy feather components, the feather components will plug into it. But what's really nice about this is you can run .NET on it, but not like some of the, the other low power devices that used to run, and some of them still do, um, .NET Compact Framework, which was a subset of .NET. This runs real .NET. So it'll run .NET Standard 2 uh, compliant, um, uh, .NET, so of course everything that you can really build within your Xamarin app, you can actually run on this little device, which is which is really really cool. But if you if you notice, it's lower spec, so that Raspberry Pi that 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 was running on, um, that was a four gigram Raspberry Pi. Um, the Raspberry Pi Zero is one gigram. This is now thirty two meg. Um, it's much lower specs, but what, what you can do with it is run for much longer. Um, you can run in places where that Raspberry Pi won't work, which is really cool. And what they've added to this board to make it perfect for IoT and things like that is it's got Wi-Fi built in. It's got Bluetooth low energy built in. It's also got things like 2D graphics. Um, if you plug in a display, it's got a 2D graphics accelerator. It's got JPEG acceleration as well built into it. Um, here we've got the board. Um, it's also the same concept of GPIO pins that you can plug things in. Um, here we've got an example. In the previous example, we had it uh, Raspberry Pi speaking to a DHT11 temperature sensor. This is a BM. BME 280. It's just a choice on, on what you want to use. Um, I do find the BME is more accurate, but, but it's, this is just an example of components you can plug in. So let's go and have a look at that. So I'm going to open Visual Studio. It's got tooling built into Visual Studio 2019. It's also got Visual Studio, uh, it's also got tooling built into Visual Studio for the Mac as well. But what's awesome about this is we've got, again, we can use NuGet packages. 
So we've got the Meadow Foundation, which is um, drivers for components that we've got. Out of that comes, out of that comes like we had in the Raspberry Pi um, example that I, that I showed you. Those were DHT 11s. This is a BM. E280. So what they've done is also componentized these things so that it's easy for you to implement things well. And the power of all this is you have all the nice things in C sharp, like you've got lambdas, um, you've got async awaits, and all those type of things on a really low power device, which which is really really impressive. So what we've got is we've got telemetry running here. So we got the temperature coming out. We've got every now and again, you'll see a spike there, um, which is sending telemetry to um, IoT Central as well. So yeah, we've we can also read from from devices. We can use our skill, our C sharp skill. We can use things that's out of the box. Here we've got communication using things that we know and love, or HTTP clients and and things like that. And if I go back to my IoT Central, uh, I can go to devices. I use the same model that I had in IoT Central for the Raspberry Pi. Um, I've got the Meadow um, device. If I had to go look here, we've got some telemetry coming in. So the telemetry is temperatures 30, humidity is 49, and we see the stream of telemetry coming in, which is quite promising. And what we've got here is a graph of our temperature and humidity and the average over the last 12 hours and, and humidity over the last 12 hours. There's little gaps here because I, I'm updating the telemetry only every couple of minutes, um, which is also quite good for battery life because things like this, you don't need to have real time um, updates in temperature unless you need to react on it. In my case, I don't. OK, so that was a just a quick look on sharing code between um, different platforms. Mobile apps, IoT devices, and of course, you can think about those other platforms that are showed as well. You can go between Tizen, MacOS, all those different platforms as well with the skills that you have. And if you're a .NET developer, you can do a lot with, with um, .NET. Um, if you want to get up and running with IoT and .NET, there's a really cool link here which will take you to, um, to this page, which will show you and, and intro you into um, .NET and .NET IoT libraries, and there's quite a nice guided learning into how all these things work, how to get these packages as well. So there's how to use that system, uh, how to get that system to device to GPIO, how to use those IoT bindings, these overviews and everything here, how to deploy .NET to, to Raspberry Pis and things. Um, also, Raspberry Pi is a starting point. It's a learning device as well. But once you've got this working and things for Raspberry Pis, it's not the only ARM device that you can deploy it to. So there's a myriad of different devices that's that's out there that you could use. Um, but a Raspberry Pi is a great way to start. So this is a great place to start for learning um, and, and get you up and running relatively quickly. If you want to see how I connected um, the applications to IoT Central, there's some nice tutorials here and, and connecting um, devices and stuff with C Sharp. There's also an SDK as well for IoT Central that you can automate creating devices um, and, and manipulate views and things like that as well. So there's a, a management API and of course there's a telemetry API as well that you can use. Um, Xamarin, we love Xamarin, and and um, you can see that I'm a Xamarin fan. Um, if you want to learn more about Xamarin, there's a link there. And the, the example app that I had was a platform called Uno Platform. And if you want to have a look at that, that's platform.uno. 
Um, is there any questions? There doesn't seem to be any questions in the chat, but when you mentioned like uh, uh, IoT devices running .NET, like, and you said, oh, this has got, got 32 megabytes of RAM, it's like, what is yes. the limits that that .NET runs? Are there some minimum specifications? You know, if I've got this chip that I want to run some .NET on, what do I need to look out for? Yeah, so so what they've done is with that meadow board, yes, you can run the full .NET, but of course you just have to be very careful in how much memory you allocate. And and of course, if you're creating like data structures and generic lists of things, um, the of course will be a limit when you when you fill up that RAM and things like that. But the runtime that they're using is um, they're using actually mono runtime on that device. And what they've done is they've streamlined it quite nicely that it doesn't itself use a lot of space. But what the actual limit is on, on memory usage of .NET, I don't know. But the, the runtime that uses the least amount of memory is still mono. That's uh, 32 megabytes, you know. That, that's, that's, you can do quite a lot in that 32 meg. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let me just switch off this aircon. <laughs> because I'm going to get buzzing in my face. Um, you got this temperature spike. Let's go over here and I can go over here and I can go. Well, let's switch off the aircon. We can <laughs> use our C sharp dot net code to do that. Now, so is, is there no questions? No, no, Derek says it's impressive. And yes, it is. And, and, and I think that's it's the whole thing. It's like you're taking your, like I, I was saying, like, okay, you can get Blazor, you bring it to mobile, but then it's like, oh, wait a minute, we've got some sort of mobile, we want to use this code on IoT. It's like this IoT, as you mentioned as well, and this, this mm -hmm. WebAssembly stuff, you know, so let's say you've got a library, this can communicate by a WebAssembly, you know, to the, the, the devices, as well as a mobile app, as well as the devices themselves can have like a dashboard. It's just, yeah. it's just really cool. Yeah. No, yeah. what is awesome about this is you don't have to, relearn a skill you can use the hmm. skill you have to learn something new about a new field like iot or or yes um going to web assembly and stuff you don't need to go and learn a different language to do it you can you can use what you know and of course that dotnet's got a huge amount of stuff and you've got a lot of experience in how it works and and things like that that you can carry with that you don't have to relearn things and, uh, and we find in lots of implementations as well, there's so much code you can reshare between different things that you do that it also saves you time and saves you a lot of money as well. Yeah, and also just as far as not like, as you mentioned as well with the compact framework, it's not like, ah, oh, we've mm -hmm. got a reduced set for this 32 megabytes of RAM. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so I used to build things for the previous version of the Meadow, which was a Netduino which was the .NET version of an Arduino, but it used Compact Framework, but you literally had to redo everything that, that you needed, that you wanted to do, um, and then figure out how to make Compact Framework do what you wanted to do. So in that case, it was probably easier to use C, C and, 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 and um, do it on an Arduino, because, uh, um, it became so much problems. But yes, with this with this meadow and stuff, you can now use the full set of, of .NET. With with this, this sort of IoT uh, and, and smartening up the home, would you have uh, like sort of say it's better to have you no know, switches that are smarter, so you communicate with switches, you know, mm. or would you have to do all messaging via central send, like a sort of a we connect this, all things go through the ones, or do you have like switches themselves being slightly smarter? And being able to, you know, have a sensor in the switch and see, you know, like, is there a, you know, way? Okay, yeah, so, put the smarts in a location. Yeah. So, 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 what, what I've done in the house though is, is this diagram that's here, that you've got smart switches and smart devices and things, um, how you communicate to them and how you get information out of it. It's always better to put it into a nice architecture. And that's why I use this MQTT as a messaging bus to those devices. So, so you saw in this um, in the setup here, I've just got a normal. Uh, where, where is it now? This device here. I've got this normal Sonoff Power R2 device. Out of the box, it can put 
messages on a queue to tell you how much power you're using and things like that on the thing that's plugged in. So this this device is the smart switch for the aircon unit that that's that fan that I switch on and off. But what it's also giving out is telemetry of what's happening. So in other words, the current I'm using, the voltage um, that it was, and all and and everything, and the power factors and all those type of things. Um, so to get that all that information out of it, that message queue is really, really cool because you've got a standard way of getting information out and putting information in. So that's why it was also very easy for me to make a Xamarin app speak to it and an IoT app because they're speaking messages on a queue. Oh, okay. Otherwise, if you have one device speaking to the other device, um, it's like code. <laughs> where it becomes like spaghetti so so your message queue is like a xamarin messenger it separates the the classes uh -huh. from each other you separating the iot devices via message bus so, so, so the same concept there is a question that says what kind of data is tops what kind of data is tops yes yeah. uh, let me go never let me just not TOPS, maybe, maybe, uh, tops. MQTT, maybe that's what it's saying. MQTT, uh, Farrell might have to just explain. Yeah, that, tops. Um, maybe, maybe repeat the question. Um, whoever asked that, well, let me just have a look if I can see it. So while Alan's trying to figure that out, just to let you guys know there is some swag tonight for the best question. I Ooh. will. I have gotten uh. a few very, very, very unique stickers sent to me by the Microsoft team up in Seattle. So my uh. suggestion is ask questions because you could yes. maybe have a ninja cat riding a dinosaur or a non whale. Or a I, I suggest I suggest attending the networking session after this. Ask questions there, and I've also got some very nice um, certification vouchers. Yeah, certification vouchers to give away, and mm. those are worth quite a lot of money. But yeah. no, um, uh, Farrell, can you um? If says, says, he says uh, it was that rather than what. He's saying, oh, no, I was saying that. Getting that data on the amount of power consumption. You know, so the get, get, getting the data oh. is tops. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, reading from this, like just the simple um, uh, smart switch. Yeah, it's it's just it's just giving that out. And what's nice about this IoT Central is this dashboard. <laughs> Just, just on the topic of IoT Central, I didn't lay out this dashboard. <laughs> I just specified a template, right? And I said, well, the, the Sonoff device gives me these parameters. So it gives me a parent power current factor power, and I just said it's a telemetry. And then what you can do is you can say, um, uh, let me just make a new version of this device. And then what I can say is, well, a view, uh, let's see, view, um, you can lay it out, but when you create this, this, all those properties, you can say generate view, and then it lays this out in the way it thinks as well. So yes, the data coming out of it is tops. I agree with that, but also this layout is really cool because I didn't do it. <laughs> so, so yay for, for cool tools. Well, and as as Farrell, Farrell mentions, you know this this data as well. That's, that's doing interesting solutions with it, and that's pretty much the yes. whole point of a smart home is to okay, I regular this guy comes home at you know six o'clock every night. You know I don't have to tell my thing. You know it learns, and that's mm -hmm. like. And then there's also things you seeing that you've got IoT devices with lots of data and lots of telemetry. You can start then inferring things from it and then put fancy things like AI on top of machine learning to learn when maybe to to um, reduce power consumptions and things like that as well. So all this you can then stream to a database and then you can run a, and do some 
number crunching and machine learning on top of these things to to infer interesting things. Uh, one, one might be like when everyone leaves the house, turn the lights off. But if you go away for an extended amount of time, start turning them on and doing stuff, you know, maybe turn the the fan yeah, so, on to make a noise so that everyone knows, oh wait, someone might be home, you know. Yeah, so it's, uh, I've got another device that's running as well, um, this air quality monitor. It also has a proximity sensor in it as well. Um, I see it's not, I don't think it's running. Uh, oh no. Yeah, so this isn't part of the demo. <laughs> Let me just play with this. This is a this is a different sensor that's running. It looks like it it's very unhappy. Yeah, so, so let me just run that. Yeah, so what this this air quality monitor has is this pie over here. Um, uh, this one this one over here, this Enviro Plus has got things like gas sensors in it. This thing here is a particulate matter sensor which works out particles in the air. So things that you don't want to breathe in and stuff. So if you're asthmatic, it measures that. Um, it also has a proximity sensor in it as well. So what you can do is I have these things on the walls and when you walk into the room, it knows you there. So then you can then do things like, yes, when you've left the room, switch on different things and 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 work it out as well. So the proximity sensor is here in the front. So it's like a a people detector. Uh, let's have a look. Is this thing running? Let's see how dirty so, that is you're breathing in. Yeah, so so this this is the, the matter sensor. So it also has also things like temperature, pressure, humidity, and things like that. Um, it then gives you um, light as well. So light intensities, but this this PM125 uh, and 10 is the, the particulate, fancy name, particulate matter sensor, which is particles in the air. And this is the gas sensor. So yeah, so, so the data that you get out of these devices is really cool. And once you've got that, that data, you can then do some interesting things on top of it. Also, as you mentioned, that's the, the health thing. Let's say you're asthmatic and the room gets, you know, pretty dodgy, or maybe you got that in a garage, picking up some carbon monoxide, or, or you know, that sort of thing. It's like you're not just mm -hmm. turning off lights and switches and, you know, automatic locking. It's like, you know, you could use this to, you know, make sure that you don't kill yourself accidentally <laughs> while doing, doing something. Well, well, that's the that's the reason why um that's that's the reason why I got these this specifically this particular matter sensor and gas sensor and things like that because when we went into the lockdown, um, uh, when we went into lockdown, I was wondering that you enclosed in these offices and things like that, in the, which is the house. Like what is in that air? Because also if you in the o real office blocks, they've got aircon and and air conditioning and things like that. It cleans the air out. I see Philip has a question about Home Assistant. Yes. Yeah, so I have Home Assistant running too. So this is, this wasn't part of this presentation. Um, this was in the last, the one I did last week. Um, I have Home Assistant running, but I also, um, I also like the DIY stuff. So I have Home Assistant and my own hacky things like this, <laughs> native apps and power apps and things like that. But Home Assistant is very nice for for reading stuff from from um, from these devices too. And what I am doing is I'm using the same message bus for Home Assistant. And then I use this node red to relay it to the cloud. I use it as a gateway. I hope that answers uh, is it Philip's question. You know, it's also I see you got uh, the Casamato. <laughs> you know the I, I just read the question there. Okay, yes, you you were saying. Yeah, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to either. But yeah, you were saying about Casamato. No, I think it's like as Philip says. You now, is there a way to use these ones without having to sort of flash it with custom, custom the switches with custom stuff? Let's say I go to the shop, I buy a bunch of bulk stuff. You know. Yeah. So yeah. So these switches are. You can still see my screen, right? 
Yeah, so yes. these switches are these Sonoff switches. So they work on their own without flashing them, but they use their, their own proprietary stuff. I think it's called Wheeling, and it does connect to the internet as well. Um, so what's, what it is, is you are kind of locked into their way of working. So this Tasmata is really nice because you then replace that with an open source firmware that you're in full control over. And you can configure these things to do um, more than what's 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 here. You can you can set up the GPIO pins on these things to do other things as well. So you can customize it too. But what's nice is it it basically makes it your device, and you can do what you like with it. And out of the box, it will connect as well to MQTT queues and 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 things. So in this example, uh, I think let me see if it's still running. Yeah, so this is the Tasmata admin. So, so if I go to the list of devices here, this is the Office Aircon. And here you've got the configuration as well. We can set up how it gets to MQTT. Um, you can also define what the power module is. And uh, where's the... It's got a... Uh, what am I looking for? I oh, know it's main menu. If you go to the console here, this is that the telemetry that I'm sucking out and sending it to IIT Central. This is the telemetry that's reading. So Tasmata does a lot for you, and you can use a lot of that of its functionality to do cool things in your house. These are just demo uh, components. Um, I'm not showing you my real house implementation. <laughs> I just had a really interesting question and then I lost it. <laughs> and then Philip is asking about Node Red. Um, mm. Yes. Is that, uh, I assume that's integration into Azure IoT. So, so what's cool about, what's cool about Node Red is you can visually map things and there's devices or, or um, components that you can add that speaks to Azure. So this is a, a component that knows about um, IoT hubs. It also knows about IoT Central because it also supports um, what's known as DPS or device provisioning service. And you can then basically say it's an IoT Central device. And then all you do is you hook up um, the IDs that you get within IoT Central and you can then call stuff. And in this case, this is how I switch on a device and switch the device off. I can switch the aircon on or the light on via messages that comes through. And then what I can do is just map things. So it's got this flow language where I can say, well, a command that comes in from IoT Central, so I can trigger things from the cloud as well. And I can say, well, flow the information to a point and then the method name that I trigger from IoT Central um, can either be turn device on or turn device off, and then I can have pause that I go, and then all I do is I send a message to my device. So what I can also do, uh, I think it's up and running, so I can go to the device here. Yeah. This is this is way off the topic of .NET though, <laughs> way, way off the topic of, of the talk, but if I had to go to this, Office Gateway, which is my node red, I can say, uh, um, what's it, sign off? Uh, well, let's turn it on. Yeah, so it's on minus light. And if I had to run that, uh, oh, wait, is that gateway running? What was it called? It was called sign off. Let's have a look. And that's the main menu, configuration, coach. Well, let's do the icon. Okay, so let's go to IoT Central, sign off, and aircon, aircon, and then this message is turn device gate on. It was, it was aircon dash one, I think. Aircon. 
aircon are you sure no that's this one. Oh. oh but this yeah this is not part of the demo i don't think i've got this thing set up let's just let's just take this just gonna just gonna hook it up live yeah well let's let's just do well, once you made it through the demos, you can only go Daniel from here. <laughs> so, so let's go to this device. Let's hook it up. So there we go. We've got our connection. So let's make sure that this is the right device. OK, so let's take the device ID. Uh, device ID. Yeah, it looks like the same device ID. Uh, primary key. Everyone's going to be controlling my house after this because they can see all my keys. Just install that plugin to hide all the secrets. Yeah, well, well, this is this is exactly why this is a demo implementation, not the real <laughs> one. Well, I'm just <laughs> glad that we've got this on record. Okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> so let's just get this thing to deploy. I see Philip's mentioning the Alex. It works well with Home Assistant. Alex X. Alex, yeah, it. Oh, Alexa. I'm assuming Alexa is yeah, Alexa. Or son off. Yes, uh, voice commands. With e yes, wing so over so LAN. A e song. And it's there. Oh, wait. Alexa is the. Uh, oh, there you go. It's the name yeah. of the GitHub repo. Well, uh, let me just. Yeah, so, so so now what I can do is I can say soil off minus light. So 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 it follows those paths within Node Red. So so I should be able to switch on the light as well. So so I can use this as a cloud-based gateway into my Node Red, which then switches on stuff in the house. It's also a nice way. Um, IT Central, they charge, the, they give you two devices for free. So what I can do is also funnel many devices through one gateway, and then I pay for nothing. Okay. You didn't hear it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't work for Microsoft, so I can say uh, that. Yeah. Okay, so let me just switch this off because it's quite bright. So I can say, well, so no. Items message and aircon. Okay, there we go. Okay, is there any more questions? We way off topic though. <laughs> oh, well, that's what happens when you go to IoT. Oh, so I just want to send a message. Oh, that doesn't work. Let me write it louder. Ooh, that feature is missing. We need to do that. <laughs> Make sure you write up. Obviously, I'm assuming that problem disappears with .NET because .NET is just so awesome. Um, <laughs> of, of course. No. Yeah, if there's, if there's no more questions, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining. And also those that's, that stayed late, thank you very much for staying. But also thank you for all those that's attended for um, the whole year. It hasn't been an easy year. Um, this is our last event, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining and, all, and also all the team for making this happen as well. Um, and Matthew for being here every week or every month and stuff and putting together cool talks. And it's work and things, so thank you very much. And the rest. Nice. Is great. Um, so those that are still around, um, we are going to have, what's the time? We are still going to have uh, a networking session. So it's acker.ms slash msdug networking. Um, as Lou says, she's got swag. Um, so we can dish out the swag of this networking event. And I do have um, certification vouchers for exams for Microsoft certifications. Cool. I'll, I'll Thanks, give it to you for a while. 
because we got feedback last time that no one saw the links for networking. That's why we didn't get uh -huh. any network people. <laughs> so I'll leave it here for a little bit. <laughs> that but explains us all talking to each other like morons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but thank you very much for everyone, uh, everyone that attended. And we'll see you in the next chat. Yeah. All right. I'll be hopping over there. I'll right, see everyone there with swag. Cheerio. Catch you on the have a good side. evening for those that I'm not going to see, but see you later. <laughs>